So the breakaway today is significant, I think, in the Tour de France. We've got 18 riders of Ford's a trail here. The most significant is that rider Hegedol, the Canadian rider on the Garmin Transitions team, is in the breakaway. And at the moment, he's done enough to claim back time to lift him to fifth overall in the Tour de France. Yes, the fact is there are another couple of riders in that breakaway group of well, as well. This breakaway group of 18 riders uh, alongside with rider Hejadal of Team Garmin Transitions is uh, Alexander Vinokurov, who lies 14th at the start of the day, looking for six and a half minutes. And Andreas Kloden, the German rider on Team Radio Shack, who started the day on 20th, and he's looking for nine minutes and five seconds. One other guy who's made a good operation of getting into this breakaway is the man you see on the front here, the Norwegian national champion, Tor Hushoft, because there was an intermediate sprint point at 75 kilometers into the race of the small town of Mariak and he picked himself up four points there to drag himself equal to Alessandro Pataki in the green jersey points competition and he is hoping to survive because in about 10 kilometers or so there's another sprint point when we go through the small town of Langogne Right at the front, the blue jerseys today of Astana keeping number one, Alberto Contador, very close to number 11 in yellow, Andy Schleck, because that 41 seconds on the final climb of the day, which is a 10% climb of just on four kilometers, could make those seconds disappear in the favor of Alberto, or Schleck may hit him hard and gain a few more, which he needs. Well, it's the kind of climb that really does suit Alberto Contador, who's an explosive climber, and the gradient here and the climb up to Mond really does, I think, suit Alberto Contador. But with the form that we've seen Andy Schleck's got at the moment, and if he's come out of the Alps and he's still recuperating and recovering well overnight, he too could put in a, a stinging response to Alberto Contador's attacks, and we will have a very good showdown. And there are those riders too, the battle for third place is a real one with, uh, between a bunch of riders. And so they could all be looking for seconds today to climb up the overall. Sandy Sanchez is looking very good at the moment as he sits in third place overall, the Olympic champion. This 18-man breakaway is a very serious move. This is not your opportunist early morning break hoping they can gamble on the finishing ahead of the race. And nine times out of ten they don't. This one is a real race because it's got dangerous men in it and there's every chance they will survive here to the bottom of the climb at just on two minutes and 63 kilometers left to race. Well, it's put big pressure onto the main field and everybody who'd hoped to, that a breakaway would succeed of six or seven riders are probably not too happy in the fact that it's an 18-man breakaway. That's so much more difficult to pull back. And you can see a lot of riders, Phil, at the back end of the main field, yo-yoing down the convoy of cars there. They're going back to take on board bottles and drinks. Extremely important on a day like this as we look at the time-trialing position at the front. And I would expect to see here the face of what? Fabian Cancellara sleep on the job here he's just leaning on those handlebars just imagining through his brain pumping all the power into those big thighs doing what he has to do at 25 miles an hour here Nicky Sorensen uh, in second place in the red and white jersey the Danish national champion uh, as the main field continues to charge along here and once again they're turning the advantage to the main field because they brought that from two and a half minutes now down to one and three quarter minutes advantage for the 18-man breakaway, but there's still 62 kilometers to go. This has been a very long, hard chase. Uh, no easy day, no day off at all like the riders had on Bastille Day when they meandered along and just caught the main field just down towards the finish. This, I think, is a tough day which will leave its traces on many of the riders once we start to get down towards the Pyrenees because the Pyrenees, which are now beginning to loom on the horizon, has four very difficult days of racing through the big high spots of the Pyrenean Mountains, uh, right up along the side the Spanish borders. And on those occasions, I think it's the guys who recovered and would not use so much energy on these kind of stages who will come up and start to change and form the top ten overall. Well, there's the beauty, uh, Paul, as we race through the Ardèche here and continues. The breakaway is also a good battle for the team race at the moment, and uh, two rides from Case de Pan who lead the team race by a hatful of seconds over Radio Shack have got two men in this break, whereas Radio Shack only has one. So at the moment, this is in favor of Case de Pan increasing their lead in the overall situation. And there's a few riders here will feel that this breakaway is going to steal a march over the main field today. It's an interesting move. There's absolutely no question about that.
The red roofs of the town of Padel replaced by the riders as they're not too far away over the top of the church here. And they are closing in or holding. I'm not too sure. It's gone out to two minutes and two seconds now. They're not getting close to it. And this isn't a case of holding them when they want them. They're really working very, very hard to bring them back today. Well, because of the presence of the three riders we keep mentioning, uh, obviously the most dangerous is rider Hazardal of Garmin Transitions. He's just looking for five minutes and 42 seconds, uh, and two or three minutes gain on a day like this is going to put him right up into the top four or five placings at the end of the day. And then all of a sudden, the Canadian field can start to dream about the possibility of a finish on the podium. The podium position, I would have to say, third place for the moment is open to about 10 riders. Although I have to think that the two riders we've talked about a lot, Andy Schleck and Alberto Contador, they are head and shoulders above the rest. Yes, so they've got to go on the climb because one of them will for sure to test out who is going well. The face there just going down there, the Norwegian champion, Tor Hushoft. 54, well, we'll call that 55 kilometers to go, so he's coming to the kilometer sign now. Uh, for the sprint in Longonia. And if uh, if he gets there and he gets the six points, uh, then he is moving a little bit clear of Pataki. He'll be wearing green tonight. And that's what he's thinking about, that's what he wants, and uh, he may well have a chance to grapple a few more points tomorrow. Tomorrow, again, a very difficult stage right the way through the southern part of France, a rolling stage like this with no flat part of the route, route at all. It's always up or down and a very difficult leg-breaking stage in store for everybody. And that's if they've recovered from today's stage, because today's stage, the finish is way off in the distance there in the uh, town of Mond, or should I say just above the town of Mond at the aerodrome, a climb of some 1,400 feet elevation. Well, today, these riders are running approximately two and a half minutes ahead of the fastest expected time for the stage. First time they've done that, I think, since the tour started in Rotterdam, because... Uh, they're getting into that town now of Langogne. They're due there in about five minutes' time. They're going to be there pretty soon. No, they certainly will, and uh, that's uh, going to be good for the man in the breakaway, uh, Tor Hushoff, because for him, it's an important uh, number of points. But we did see at the last sprint point, he was beaten to the line by Gerard Boll, who himself, the Lamprey rider, is a very good sprinter. Very good. And he will have to do whatever he can to get across the line in front of Tor Hushoft. Yes, it's the Lamprey sprinter's first Tour de France, but he is a very good finisher. Today, he's got to play second fiddle for the top sprint on the team, which is Pataki. Uh, but I have to say that uh, he is a good sprinter. And uh, he's now going to take on Tor Hushoff. There's the one kilometre now to go to the sprint. You can see Hushoff does time to line himself up. The Kofidis rider on the front, uh, just behind him, Antony Chateau. Uh, Hushoff has got on his wheel Gerard Bolle. That's the rider with the pink shoulders on his jersey. So the reason of Bolle, there he is sitting in that pink top jersey, fourth in line. His job now is to win the sprint, to take maximum green points away from Hushoff. It worked in Mariak, where he got the sprint over Hushoff, took away two points, and that kept Hushoff from taking the outright lead there. Whatever happens now, I can't see Hushoff not taking the lead, but Bolle will still want to take the main points. Looking at the faces now of the leaders, uh, this is Moanar, the Cofferdis rider, in the breakaway of those 18 men, but interest now swings for the moment from the yellow jersey, Paul, to the battle for green as we're approaching the sprint point. Well, in second place there, being led out here by Anthony Chateau, is the Norwegian national champion, a man who is the defending champion in the green jersey points classification, and Hushoff is going to have to open up his sprint pretty smartish. Well, he's going to have to go now because Bolle has gone on the left of the road, and I don't think uh, Hushoff is as quick as Gregor Bolle, the younger rider in his first, but he is this time. Hushoff is a real competitor, isn't he? Well, you know, Phil, this is how he won the Green Jersey that, Points yes. competition. Thank you very much. He said six points in the bag, and that will now give him the lead by six points in this classification. He went out on a mountain stage, cast your mind back to the Tour de France last year, and it was on a mountain stage that he guarded enough points to go ahead of Mark Cavendish. I think that gesture there, Phil, tells it all. Well, 80 kilometres have passed by since the last sprint point, and uh, the youngster, Greg Bolle, just 24 years of age, and maybe it's starting to hurt as the distance bites now, and it is his first Tour de France, not the same for Tor Hushoff. So Hushoff gets the sick point, Bolle four, Chateau two. So overall now it means that Hushoff has 167 and Pataki loses his green today, 161. So reversal of yesterday.
Yep, but that's a competition that will continue and continue to be fought out all the way up to the finish line on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And uh, how about that for a little model just at the side of the road? Once again, now we're starting to move uh, into the area of the Ardèche and the Lozère, two incredibly interesting departments of France, which uh, very much are the holiday destinations for many of the French people. The villages that we drove through last night were nearly all en fête. Everybody enjoying the uh, countryside, everybody enjoying the evening. In fact, we came into one uh, little village and there was a couple of kids playing soccer in the middle of the main road. They obviously weren't <laughs> expecting the Tour de France cars to come through. I don't think anybody moves through that village after 7 o'clock at night. There certainly isn't a rush hour, that's for sure. And they're using the main road as their car, as their playground. They seemed almost, they did look at us as if they'd never seen a motor car before, didn't they? Well, it was probably my fault because I was on the wrong side of the road yeah. in a right-hand drive car. That probably uh, oh, called that's out. what they probably didn't recognise. Our steering wheel was on the wrong side. There you go. Just this is out. the reservoir here, Nozak. Yeah, Nozak, it's uh, the county's largest lake. And uh, the, it actually is an artificial lake once again. It's got a dam wall of 250 metres of height. And it's just down towards the end here. The uh, village of Nozak was, in fact, uh, flooded when they built this dam in the 1970s and uh, moved to a different part of the world. But it's also used, as you can see, for a, an awful amount of leisure sailing too. It's a big tourist uh, site, and it actually has a beach at the far end of it. Well, as we move on into the township now, and again, a nicely laid out town here. We're still in the Ardèche, but very shortly, we are going to transfer. In fact, no, we're not. We've entered the Lozère at the, at the spin point. So we've now changed departments for the last time today as we race up towards the finish. The local newspaper this morning, it's called the Midi Lieb. It's always lovely to read the local newspaper. Then you get a real feeling for what the people of the area think of the Tour de France and the atmosphere that abounds because they go and get good stories off the local people. And everybody just loves this race coming into town. And... Uh, you know, they use headlines like, uh, the tour has come to, is coming to our region. We have got the tour in our region. They're very appreciative of the Tour de France. Yeah, no, the amazing thing is in France, uh, when you look at the uh, circulation of the newspapers, the regional newspapers actually sell a lot more than the national newspapers because people are so much more proud of the region that they come from. Well, the Tour de France, uh, this is the main field now at 2-7. So they're beginning to uh, not, to be, well, not beginning, they're just not holding this breakaway at all. It's nibbling a lead as we come through the 50-kilometre point. Jens Voigt there, a very serious face of pain on at the moment. No big pain on the face of the yellow jersey. He knows what his men are trying to do. And he won't over-worry if they hold it at two minutes. Uh, then when we get to the climb out of Mond, it won't be two minutes by the finish. No, they could. Well, these guys could probably wipe off a minute off the advantage of that breakaway group over the final five kilometres of the climb up to the finish from the town of Mond because the majority of that climb is exceptionally steep and suits the kind of abilities of uh, Andy Schleck and Alberto Contador. But those two guys, I do feel, feel might go head-to-head. -head. Took a little bit of a move here as the riders are beginning to be stretched. Yeah, that looks like a little acceleration there coming from Andreas Cloden, who now is starting to realise that 50 kilometres to go, there may be one or two passengers are on the back end of this group. Torhusov swinging over there, his job done for the day. He's probably saying this is just a little bit too hard for me. And there you can see that Cloden is very much relayed there by Alexander Vinokurov. Torhusov, I think, has decided to call it a day. All that he was interested in out of today's stage was to try and get himself the uh, points out on the course. And uh, one of the casualties of that acceleration, of course, is Christoph Kern. They will not see that group again. They will very shortly be picked up by the main field. Torhusov, Christoph Kern, uh, they've been uh, dropped. The only two riders to become casualties of that acceleration. Good smile on his face, and you know why that is because he's got himself uh, the lead in the king of the king of the sprints of the green jersey points classification at the end of today. And they can be certain that he will go out and battle for that again on the roads of the Tour de France tomorrow. So, uh, virtually at the moment, Hushoff leads the points classification by six points from Alessandro Pataki. Welcome back. Interesting developments during the break. That man, Alexander Vinokurov, has cracked this break open. Three other men are with him, Vasil Kirienka, Ryder Heijudal and Andreas Klurden. 
And Chris Boardman, what do you think is in Vino's mind? Well, I'm quite surprised to see him doing a lot of the work. Uh, I would have thought it would be a great opportunity for him to just sit on, monitor everything, uh, and then if they do stay away, go for the stage win. I suppose it, it does. If he gets closer to uh, to the lead, then it becomes more of a danger for Team Saxo Bank. They've also forced Team so Saxo Bank to have to work all day, which is quite a, quite a good tactic, really. That's going to make it difficult for them to lead Andy Schleck into the bottom of that climb. And, of course, Alexander Vinokurov knows what it's like to win on this climb. He's been f here before and taken a win in uh, the Midi Lieb race. So does Alberto Contador, his teammate. He's won here twice in Paris-Nice. The question is, who's going to be best placed at the bottom of the climb? At the moment, it looks like Vino and co. Let's get back out onto the road and rejoin commentary. As we look down from the helicopter, these 18 men suddenly have imploded here and four riders have gone forward and the rest are struggling. It happened soon after they came through the sprint where Hushoff got the sprint in Langonia. And now we've got four riders trying to go clear, which includes Alexander Vinokurov, Andreas Kloden and Ryder Hezidal. Trying to get across the gap there, the rider at the front is uh, Mario Ert, who's been uh, very aggressive uh, on a number of occasions throughout this tour. He's seen that move, he realises how dangerous it is, but I'm not sure whether he's got the legs to ride across to this gap. You can see the lime green jersey on the number of, of the rider in Case de Pania, Kir Kirienka, that indicates that this is the team that leads the king of the team's classification, and they have been extremely consistent. They only lead by 31 seconds ahead of Radio Shack, which is why Andreas Cloden has got himself into this breakaway group. Very, very observant as Radio Shack take on uh, Case de Pania head-to-head. Uh, these four riders, the strongest riders in the breakaway, best placed overall, and now pushing on to see what they can do here, because the Canadian, who's doing a lot of work at the front left there, rider, rider Hezidal, uh, wants this to succeed by about three minutes, and he'll be in the top five of the Tour de France tonight. Well, currently at three minutes and 22 seconds, he's uh, tickling third place overall, and he's uh, started the day uh, five minutes and 42 seconds behind uh, Andy Schleck. And for him, if uh, he could conserve a good chunk of this advantage on the run down towards the finish line, well, then all of a sudden he's starting to dream about a podium finish in Paris. He's a big, strong bike rider. His background uh, comes from uh, racing uh, mountain bikes before he decided to come across here and participate in road racing, and he's been extremely successful. He's had a good season so far this year as well, the Canadian, as... Uh, in the early part of the season, he won his first uh, big grand stage race. This is the remnants of the group have lived here, being led by Sandy Kassar, and they're looking for around about 30 seconds. Sandy Kassar, you see that indication with his arm there? That was to the other guys in the breakaway group to say, come on, let's get organized, let's start working together. We've still got a long way to go to the finish. We can't let this group go. really fractioned and this is uh, what it looks like at the back end of the main field and there's a lot of pressure on that group there is Mario Ertz he's back in the group so he wasn't able to get across the gap it's now uh, from the four-man leading group uh, 35 seconds and three and a half minutes back to the main field so Kirienka on the far side number 157 165 this is Cloden Twice he's finished second in the Tour de France. Uh, Tor Hushoft uh, and Christoph Kern about to get picked up by the main field. He's got a big smile on his face, a wry smile, I'd have to say, there for uh, Tor Hushoft because he knows, job done. He'll probably go and have a quick chat with Alessandro Pataki and say, sorry, mate, you want to win that green jersey, you're going to have to keep a very close eye on me. He'll come up onto the podium uh, once he's dragged his big body up to the top of the climb of uh, Mond here. And he will be awarded with the green jersey as leader of the points classification tonight. So, Hazardal, it was uh, a good win for him uh, in the early part of the year as well on the uh, eighth stage of the Amgen Tour of California. A very difficult stage, a mountainous stage on the, uh, it was the final day of the Amgen Tour of California. He's in the breakaway now. And that's him just sitting at uh, the back of that group. And the fact that they've pulled all the team cars in there very quickly indeed is an indication that the race referees actually believe that they're going to start to pull away from the remnants of the break. That gap is still hovering at uh, 35 seconds. 
second group on the road, which is down to about 12 men. What they want to do, they want to try and pull back these roads, but these are ideal racing roads. They're undulating, they're hard, they're rolling along all of the time. You're either going uphill or down dale as they make their way right through the very heart of this uh, new department which we've entered into now, the Lozère. And it's a beautiful part of France. There's hardly any big roads at all. That's uh, Guido Bontempi, a great famous sprinter, the team manager for Astana there. In his own time, he won plenty of stages at the Tour de France as well. Still, the pressure now is really being put on uh, Team Saxo Bank, and it's still Fabian Cancellara sitting on the front end of the main field, followed by Nicky Sorensen. And now Team Cervelo Test Team have come up to them at the front end of the main field. Coming around the outside, you see the Astana rider. He's actually just coming up to bring on board bottles, and he's going to just slip back over and go back down the left-hand side there, and the idea then he's going to hand them out to his teammates. Just looking down the road here, these motorbikes are uh, either, either cameramen or race radios or referees, and there they're just riding at the front end of the peloton. So looking at 350 and counting as we speak, our computer hovering on the 351 now, the elastic may have snapped here. Almost certainly now, this breakaway, especially the four up front, are going to get to the base of the climb ahead of the field. We're heading for a terrific showdown in the towns of Mond today. Well, this is proving a very, very tough day in the office now for the riders. Look at the length of the peloton here. They are very concerned about four leaders who've gone clear from the original breakaway. And 3.47 is a big time gap still at only 38 kilometres to go. I think all of a sudden people have started to realise that that is an extremely dangerous breakaway of four riders because even Cervelo test team, the team of Carlos Sastra, has come up to the front end of the main field. Maybe he's nurturing thoughts of trying to get himself a stage victory this afternoon. He's obviously not doing the work at the front end of the pack for, uh, for Tor Hushoff because Hushoff, Phil, is not going to get his body up to the top of this climb in the main field. Two more names for you as well, Paul Roman Kreuzinger and Ivan Bassa, because the Leaky Gas boys are also putting a man in the chase. And just sitting in the wings, waiting very happily and very comfortably are the riders in the turquoise jerseys of Team Astana. That's the teammates, of course, of Alberto Contador. They're very happy with the situation. They have now finally put everybody else on the back foot. They've got other teams up against the ropes in uh, the in, in boxing terms because of the fact that they've got Alexander Vinokurov in the leading group of four riders looking very dangerous indeed. And in fact, Alexander Vinokurov with uh, a three minutes, 45 second advantage at the moment would also be tickling a top five position at the end of the day. That's the difference between the four and the 12. Two riders didn't survive uh, the split there because two riders going back into the main field, Tor Hushoff and Christopher Kern. But this is turning out to be a battle royale on this stage. As we look now, Paul, at the breakaway. This is the remnants of the breakaway just now. Is it a super move, this, by rider Hegedal? And I suppose we should have expected it because he's, he's always said he wasn't going to give up trying. Well, you can't give up trying it, but you have to have the form to continue attacking like that. And he's obviously got great form. He's ridden through the Alps. He had a bad day a couple of times, but now all of a sudden he's still up at the top of the overall standing. He's still looking to try and ride himself into a podium position. He started the day in 12th. If we stop the race right now, Phil, he would actually be third overall. And I don't think you could have expected that. That's a nice change for him as uh, Sandy Kassar is working very hard on the front of the remnants of the breakaway, which is slowly getting back together. There is Constantine Shipsoff there of the HTC Columbia team of Mark Cavendish. He's just as his wounds were drying up from his crash a week ago, he's fallen off today and they've all reopened and he's been dressed by the doctor on the move, but he's still in the remnants of the breakaway. Breakaway of four are still clear, by the way. They're not that far up the road and it looks now as though Savella have decided that uh, now Hushoff's done what he can do today. They're going to try and put their leader, Carlos Sasta, into the race. Well, what a day that would be for them. That would be a real double header for them if they could get Carlos Sastra the victory. Sastra is the kind of guy, he's far enough down in the overall standings, Phil, to uh, make a big attack on the slopes of the climb up to Mond here and not get chased down by the Andy Schleck Alberto Contador tandem. Well, it's a big relief uh, being breathed by Saxo because they've got allies now in the uh, Cervelo team here. Sastra's just tucked in down the line, by the way. And we've also got Ivan Basso, Roman Cruising as Leaky Gas Boys contributing as well. 
This is not a good sign for the breakaway, of course. So it's down to 3.36, 3.38 at the moment. So they are getting their way in to that lead. I think they'll try and reduce it to two minutes in Mond and then the battle of the climb, which uh, these days is the Monte Long Jalabert. These are the faces of the men in the break. Kirienka is here. The face of Andreas Cloden, who's been a second-place finisher in the Tour de France, uh, on the podium twice. New boy rider Hezidal, the tall man who uh, seems to be a pretty good climber as well, a very strong bike rider indeed. He's only, well, he's 29 now, Paul, but he's done some things in his career. No, he certainly has. Uh, Alexander Vinokurov just sitting at the back there. This is, this is a great tactical situation for Timo Stana to be in. It's the first time, I think, Phil, in the Tour de France this year that they've been in the tactical superiority position. Yeah, well, that's absolutely right as well. But uh, there's the peloton. The boys in turquoise is uh, Alberto Contador's Astana team. He's got them all mustered now right in position behind the saxo bank team of andy schleck those two have got to go pedal rev for pedal rev on the climb when we get there well they're uh, just going around the same corner in fact that the uh, riders in the breakaway went round a, a little while back about three minutes ago and you can see now that the pressure really is being put on that main field tonight when these guys get to the finish in Mornfield, they will know that they've been in a bike race Tough day today. We go down to uh, from Rodez tomorrow in the heart of the Ardèche. We move down out into uh, Ravel, which is outside the county, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's always extremely hot. But you know, it's been extremely hot every day. Lance Armstrong saying this is the hottest tour he can remember, and that's saying something when he's ridden 13 of them. Well, he should cast his mind back to 2003 because I think it was rather warm in 2003. In fact, it was the heat that nearly uh, dethroned him when he had a very nasty time trial around the uh, Cap de Couvert and lost himself a huge chunk of time to Jan Ulrich. Well, it's like suffering, isn't it, Paul? When it's gone, you tend to forget what it was like, and then it comes back. Yeah, well, you always forget the pain, and fortunately you do, because certainly uh, when I look at these images, I cannot remember the pain that I used to go through just to stay in, in contact with the Tour de France. On this occasion, these four guys, they've actually got themselves locked in to a 35-second advantage mm. over the front end of that group that's chasing them, and it's not going anywhere currently because those guys, the 12 riders behind, they know that if they lift up the, the pedaling action a little bit, they can pull the four men back but if these four get to the hill the break will never catch them so just looking at Andreas Cloden having a quick chat there at uh, the rider in front of him uh, funnily enough for Andreas Cloden and the man behind him Alexander Vinokurov in the turquoise jersey they used to be teammates many years ago when they rode for the great T-Mobile squad looking there at uh, rider Hazardal the Canadian rider he was a uh, second in the World Cross Country Championships at a junior level in 1998. And he was uh, second in the World Cross Country Championships as a senior in 2003 before deciding to uh, change over and start riding on the road. A big acceleration there by Sandy Kassar has split this 12-man group. Sandy Kassar obviously feels that he's really got to pull this back, you know. He's a man who now has won three stages in the Tour de France, and for many, many years he was criticised by the French press as being the eternal second, because he always finished second on stages in the Tour de France until eventually he managed to break that, and in 2007 he got himself his first victory, having T-boned a dog halfway through the stage, broken his bike, finishing on a borrowed bike. He's a little bit uh, upset here because he's not getting the cooperation in this group that he wanted, and he knows now that they've got to work together they've got to work extremely hard don't hold anything back at this point if you want to pull back the leading quartet well they're still uh, trying to get things mustered up here to race back up to those four it'll be hard we've uh, we were just about to crack I think Sipsov and Gregor Bolle but they tipped over the top and now they've come back on again well, I think that's why that quartet actually went off the front end of the field Phil, because they felt as far as they were concerned that they were starting to get too many passengers Nice little view here, the Chateauneuf de Rondon and the statue there. Paul Sherman is now going to tell us all about it, I hope. Well, this is the statue of uh, Du Guesselin. And Bertrand Du Guesselin, who lived between 1320 and 1380, was one of the great nobles of this area. And he's renowned for taking part in the defence of such cities as Rennes, which was besieged by Henry of Gromont, who happened to be the Duke of Lancaster. Well, the English gave him the name of the Black Dog of the Brolenchilon region.
Well, we're looking at the yellow numbers here on the back of Vasily Kirienka because they're cased upon are the team leaders, but they're only by a few seconds over Radio Shack, and that's why Andreas Cloden is here for his team. These four guys are slowly pulling away. The overall gap to the peloton with yellow is now 3 minutes and 13 seconds. 28 and a half kilometers to go to the finish, more or less. And that means about 23 kilometers or just on 15 miles before we shoot into this lovely town of Mond. But the left turn's a bit narrow and then we climb out of the climb itself uh, to the local airport here, which, by the way, is closed. The Tour de France is on the runway. Yeah, a bit difficult to uh, bring a, a small light plane in amongst the, uh, the finishing line structures, I would have to say. If you could pilot, you could possibly do it, but I don't think you'd want to try. <laughs> you'll have to dodge the finish podium when you land after about the first 500 feet. It's a very good finishing speed. Of course, it would be an ideal finish for a spinter, but they won't be able to hold on on the race up to the line because they literally come on to the main runway and they race right down it, dead flat. The only thing is, they've got to really judge their finish today. It is a headwind right down the runway. No, it certainly is. And uh, just looking at the way this race is evolving, uh, those, those 12 riders behind, they will not give up at all, but they're still locked in at that 40-second mark. They cannot catch these guys. There's a lot of firepower in this leading four. There is Ryder Hejadal, the Canadian, number 54. And as you said earlier, Phil, I'm certain that uh, the people in Canada will be sitting on the edge of their seats right now, hoping and wishing that this man could climb a lot higher up in the overall standings. He's been a great uh, cross-country mountain bike racer in the past. He finished second in the World Championships. But here, he's really completely committed to riding on the road. And he's riding for a team which in the past has had some great success out of the Tour de France. Fourth overall with Christian van der Velde, couple of years ago fourth overall last year with Bradley Wiggins and why not uh, a podium finish for the Canadian rider Hazardal with the time that he's pulling back today he's looking at it we're gonna know soon well it's uh, three minutes to the main field so it's now starting to be uh, slowly dragged back for the main field a little study of the bike here and this is the bike of Alexander Vinokurov a special design there for a specialized machine well, this is this seems to be this seems to have become the, the real uh, pastime of a lot of the teams and a lot of the riders nowadays to have these specially decal bikes something that uh, I think is quite interesting for the spectators to see and I suppose all of that was started uh, by uh, team Trek as you can see the Trek bike there of uh, the man in second position Andreas Cloden and Cloden uh, finished third in the Olympic Games in Sydney back in 2000 behind Alexander Vinokurov, who was uh, the rider in here for Kazakhstan and for Astana. Now, Cervelo test team coming to the front. They're quite happy to do some pacemaking. Uh, notice not too far away from the front, uh, Carlos Sastre. These riders obviously feel that today there could be a change in the overall standings, and that's what they're looking for. They realize how important, they realize how steep this climb is, and why not try and pull back the breakaway group and offer a victory to Carlos Sastre? But at the moment, the main field are making a pretty tough job of trying to eat into the advantage of this quartet. Well, Carlos Sastre is a rider who has won the Tour de France, and it would be lovely to see him challenged today, but he doesn't seem to be quite the man he is anymore. I'd like to say he was, because I'd love to see Carlos win. He's in his 10th Tour de France, 17th last year. He was the king of the mountains, for five, and he led the race for five days and then finally won it in 08. Uh, before that, he was fourth, he was third. Um, Paul, but he just seems to be going down a little bit now. Well, let's, let's hope uh, I'm wrong. Well, uh, the, the other thing is, Phil, he has had a certain amount of uh, bad luck with injuries during the course of this season. And, in fact, there was a big question mark as to whether or not he was actually going to participate in the Tour this year, if up until 15 days to go before the start. He is here, and uh, he's still riding fairly high overall in the standings. He's 16th at the start of the day. And, again, a couple of minutes could have him right up inside of the top 10 because from uh, the top 10th position down to the 20th position, the riders there are only separated by three minutes. Well, again, talking to riders at the start this morning, uh, Levi Leipheimer says it is simply pain today when you get onto the final climb. It doesn't suit his style of racing. He said all you can do is just suffer and hope you can produce the goods because everybody will attack on the climb. And, of course, the battle for third place in this year's Tour de France, you could get odds in probably the next eight or nine men because, the, because of the way the Pyrenees are laid out this year, we will not know the answer to third place for an awful long way. Maybe not until the, at the end of the time trial. 
No, definitely. On the, the slopes of this climb up here, if you've got good form, you can very easily prize out a minute. It's not really regarded yeah. as a big mountain top finish. It's regarded as a hilltop finish. But to me, it's a very hard climb. And looking at the time gaps that we've seen in races like Paris-Nice that have been here before, and in the Tour de France when it came back here on two previous occasions, yeah. there have always been time gaps at the top of the finish line here in Monde. There we are, Bravo, the gentleman riders of the route. They used to call them the convicts of the road because they stole everything off the roadside stands. So just looking at uh, the uh, leading group of four now, Alexander Vinokurov uh, having a little pop-up drink there to keep himself, uh, first of all, uh, hydrated, but also just to maybe get a little bit of extra sugar into the system, especially over the last uh, 40 minutes or so of the race. The... Uh, chasing group now of 12 seem to be uh, flagging a little bit because now for the first time that gap has stretched up to around about the 45 second mark but they won't give up at all and they're really being spurred on by the Frenchman they're sitting in there in third position there in that line of riders and that of course is Sandy Kassar well this is this is really tough it's interminable for these riders they can see the prey but can't catch them so there's the peloton and in the back uh, drop there the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck he's so happy to be riding in yellow he didn't seem to blink an eyelid at the thought if he wants to win the tour he would have to keep it for the best part of two weeks he just wanted to wear it well he's a confident rider most of the big hills and the rolling hills are behind the riders now the most important thing is now is what is on the horizon how about that as a sight for sore eyes there the banner indicating 25 kilometers to go to the finish Vinokurov in this breakaway group looking for six and a half minutes Hazardar looking for 540 and he's actually looking for his team car to come up here. I think he wants to take on board some more liquid before we get to the 20 kilometer to go point. That's right. When well, officially that's uh, the end of the liquidity of the race. You can't come up to the riders. So I think the referees might allow it a bit longer today because of the climb at the finish. They can alter that rule as they go along. Uh, we'll see what they do. Anyway, here's your doll enjoying yourself but you know the main uh, rest remnants of the breakaway not that far behind here they're now under 25 to go though without Tor Hushoft he decided to go back to the main field he got the lead in the in the green jersey that's what he was there for and he just sat up once the attacks came that caused this split well that was uh, Mauro Sant'Ambrogio the Italian rider on team BAC, BMC who was uh, trying to force the pace a fraction there it looks like a little bit of a ragged organization in that 12-man chase group while the main field they are slowly starting to approach the the leading quartet now they were at one stage at three minutes and 40 seconds they've now got it to just inside of the three minute mark but there are different teams coming to the front to do the pace making Brett Lancaster there the big man from team Cervelo test team Matty Lloyd over to the left hand side it's a kind of race that would suit him at the finish today absolutely and he's not a marked man uh, as far as the yellow jersey is concerned but I feel that the everybody will try to steal time today so it, they'll just all hit it and hope that they can do it David Miller sitting at the back end of the group he's had a, a hard ride through the mountains he has uh, got a couple of cracked ribs but because this is the Tour de France he's very happy to stick it out and try and stay in the event the fact that you can see these riders just uh, hugging to the right hand side of the road is an indication that there is some breeze coming from the left hand side of the road these guys down the right they're just trying to find a little bit of shelter from the wind well you can see the breeze is now turning into quite a stiff one because the trees are bashed around there it's across the riders it'd be a headwind finish right down the aerodrome plateau though and that could mean if there are survivors of the breakaway, they need to judge their sprint absolutely perfectly. This is Kirienka. I wonder if he'll get the victory today. He was uh, very much outwitted by Sergio Paolino. Yeah. I think on paper he was the fastest finisher, but he made a slight mistake in looking the wrong way when the Portuguese rider attacked on the run into gap. And once the Portuguese rider had the gap, it was done. This is the second group now. We're now looking at 22 kilometers to go to the finish, and uh, we are now just meandering through some very small hamlets on this running down towards the finish line. There are no major towns for the riders to go through, and uh, we will very shortly drop down into the valley of the Lot. And the Lot is uh, another very interesting river which flows uh, into the Garonne, and the Garonne uh, actually goes out into the Atlantic Ocean right by Bordeaux. So, Team uh, Omega Pharma Lotto now have decided to come to the front as well. Everybody worried about that position of Heijerdal. 
A lot of work now being done, and this is for Jürgen van den Broek too, who is really, really turning on the style for Belgium this year, giving them something to cheer in the overall. That's not often done for the Belgians these days. Well, in the main field, we're looking at about 56 kilometres now. That's 34 and a half miles an hour as they go slightly downhill here. What's happening now, Phil, is a slight change in the tactics of the other teams. Teams like uh, Jürgen van den Broek and Denny Menchov are starting to feel their position threatened by rider Hezerdal. Welcome back. Well, we haven't seen it, but news coming through on race radio that Garmin's Tyler Farrar, blocked in yesterday's sprint, of course, has abandoned the race. We knew he was injured. He had that broken bone in his arm earlier on. He is out. The race is hotting up with just under 17 kilometres left to race and the lead at 1.51. Well, this is still the four-man leading breakaway at the front of the race with an 18-second advantage over the 12 chasers, but the gap now to the main field is starting to come down with the assistance at the front end of the main field for Saxo Bank coming from Cervelo Test Team. And the gap is hovering now at inside of 1 minute and 50 seconds. We're looking at 16 kilometres to go. It's a long, flowing dra drag down into the outskirts of Mond, and that's when the riders will start to pick their way through this city in the middle of Lorez. And that's when we will start to see the uh, final approach to this very nasty final climb of the day, the climb of the Côte de la Croix-Neuve, or as it's known nowadays, the Monte laurent jalabert because the Frenchman won on this climb in 1995 when it was Bastille Day. He was wearing the green jersey on his shoulders on that occasion, and it was at the end of a very long breakaway as the one we've witnessed here today. But behind, this breakaway group has never really been given an awful lot of freedom because of the presence of three riders in that leading group. Rider Hazardal of Canada, Alexander Vinokurov of Kazakhstan, and Andreas Cloden. Well, we're right, diving down now into the town. It's a nice, uh, look. there's a lot of descending pool that brings us into this beautiful town of Mond. And then the way out is <laughs> around a little tiny narrow corner with a left and a right, just the width of a car, and then we're on the climb. And the climb is horrendous. It's around about 11% the gradient at the bottom. It's very steep indeed. 15 kilometres to go, the riders just this moment passing under the bridge here, four leaders, it could be a blanket finish now because they are coming down, 146 across the board. Well, there you can see uh, on the far side of the valley, that's where we're going to climb up to. That, in fact, is the aerodrome just above the town of Mond. 15 kilometres and Team Cervelo testing. I have a feeling today, Phil, that, in fact, Carlos Sastra is actually feeling pretty good. He's asked his guys to come to the front and try and pull all of this back together. Well, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house because Carlos is quite a popular boy and uh, if he's going to go, today's a good time to do it. You might gamble and think that the other boys won't hit each, hit each other. But I can't see how anybody can fail not to attack today. There's time available on these slopes and it could be enough time to win the Tour de France ball, especially if Andy Schleck prized open the gap a little bit more. Well, Andy Schleck, we've seen, has got a great acceleration on these steeper gradients, and he may well look for that, but Andy Schleck will be certainly challenged by Contador. Just to, as a brief reminder, Andy Schleck has got a 41-second advantage at the start of the day over Alberto Contador and 2 minutes 45 over third-place rider, a Beijing Olympic champion, Sammy Sanchez. And the gap now is coming down very quickly. It's 23 seconds to the 12 chasers, a minute 46 to the main field. But we have had a bike race here this afternoon. It's been very difficult. There will be a lot of tired bodies. And sad to see the sprinter from the United States, Tyler Farah, who uh, was third on the stage yesterday, has uh, abandoned the race at the back. We don't know why he's abandoned the race, uh, but we did hear that over race radio, and that was officially announced just a couple of moments ago. There's a number of teams actually coming up to the front to do the pacemaking. Liqui Gas, they could be thinking about their man, Roman Krujiga, or even Ivan Basso. Team Cervelo Test Team are helping Saxo Bank and Omega Pharma Lotto at the front end of the main field. Shortly, it wouldn't be a surprise to me to see Team Astana come to the front end of the peloton to see whether or not they can set something up for the big man from uh, Madrid, Alberto Contador, defending champion of the Tour de France this year. That's the second group on the road, and that should be 12 men in there. 
One and three quarter minutes, the spread between the four front men uh, over the top of the rest of the breakaway down to the peloton. It is going to be desperate moments as we drop into Monda now and everybody will throw everything at everyone as they climb away from the town. Yeah, the worst thing about this climb, Phil, is uh, there's no tactics on a climb like this because no. you've just got to do everything you can just to get up the climb. It is so steep. As I said earlier, you know, once you get to the bottom of the climb, it almost immediately tips up in front of you. The first part of the climb for the first kilometre is only 8.5%. But once you've cleared the first kilometre, the next two kilometres are 11%. And it really is. I mean, driving up this morning, it was extremely steep. Yes, it was. Um, and there's nine kilometres to go now to the actual town itself before we start the climb. And where are we? The main break, we're still with the chasing group here, I think, at the moment, as they're still trying to jump away from that group. Is that Carlos Barredo, I think, who's yep. got himself on the front that, here? That he was. was the man involved in that boxing match a few days ago when the judges showed uh, double levels there because they really should have described Barredo and Costa uh, Alfaro there for fighting, and they really did fight too. Well, that certainly was a big scrap, and I uh, find it a bit strange that they were uh, for being involved in that little contretemps fracas after the finish line. They were fined at $300 each, whereas Mark Renshaw, who was involved in uh, pretty much a, a, a normal run-of-the-mill type maneuver, and the sprint was ejected from the race instead of being relegated and given a severe warning. Barredo going again there. He realizes now at uh, 10 kilometers to go, there's a possibility here of uh, surviving off the front end of the main field, but the peloton is looking for one and a half minutes. So we're 10 kilometers to go, Phil. We're about three and a half kilometers from the town of Mond. At the moment, it appears everybody's on their upper limits here because this group has never lost but can't get closer to these front frontrunners, and the peloton can't close in either. Kirienka there, outwitted uh, the other day by Palinho, but now will he be able to go on the climb himself here? And what about rider Hejadal? He's still, his gains are coming down now, but he's still gaining some time if he can stay away to the finish. Oh, just funny, I'm uh, just identifying the motorbike rider there, just on the left-hand side. Uh, that is uh, Bruno Washtinek's brother. Bruno Washtinek, a very good rider in his own right in the 1980s, finished second in Paris-Roubaix. And he was uh, up alongside the riders there, and his job is to offer them drinks if they still need to take on board drinks. 9.8 kilometres to go, and it's, uh, in fact, a stretched out to the 12-man group now, Phil, to 37 seconds. Yeah. But the main field is slowly approaching the four leaders at a minute and 20. Yes, as we now are coming up here to what will be the 10 kilometers to go sign. And this for the chase, remember, our four leaders have just gone through just 10 kilometers. Now we come into the town of Mond at around about seven kilometers to go. So we're not too far away from seeing the town. I suppose technically we're on the outskirts here. Yeah, technically we are. The uh, Monde is the capital of the Gévaudan region of uh, France, uh, right in the middle of the département of the Lozère. You can see other riders moving up through the outside now. I think the fire has gone out of the lead-out from this main field now, Phil, and they realise they're probably not going to catch that quartet before the start of the climb. I wouldn't be surprised very shortly to see Tima Stana come to the front and start organising the pacemaking for their man Alberto Contador because Contador, I think, would like to have a crack at attacking here. He knows his climb well. He's won twice at the top of the aerodrome in Monde, but not at the Tour de France. On that occasion, it was in the race called Paris-Nice, which is in the springtime. Yes, and in the snow when they came up, actually. It was on the sides of the road and quite visible. Uh, so form is different now. Riders are on different levels of fitness. It's the Tour de France. They all want to be on their best level. These four riders here, this is a typical move by Alexander Vinukurov uh, to get into an advantage like this. And Cloden here had to be in. Armstrong said this morning, if a break goes, we need one of our strongest riders in it because of the battle for the team prize. And they've got a strong rider now in Cloden. They do, and uh, just at uh, the front end of the main field, I noticed Cadell Evans was being piloted up to the front end of the peloton by George Hincapie. Very good. So, the race situation now, we're still looking at this quartet of riders, Vinokurov, Cloden at the back, Hezudal on the front, the other rider in there, who's a, the lowest placed rider in the overall standings, Vasily Kirienka of Case de Pania. 40 seconds back to the 12-man group. That's Mario Ertz over on the left-hand side in the white jersey. Again, a rider who's been extremely aggressive throughout this Tour de France this year, and he's a man who really has made a resurgence to the top end of the sport. The other rider in the group there, well, this is Carlos Barredo in the blue and white. He rides for Team Quickstep. 
There is Anthony Chateau, who at the end of the day, in the pale blue jersey there, will get himself the lead in the King of the Mountains classification. And the other rider in there for France and for uh, Case Depagne as well is uh, Perger. There's the big lead-out now. The big lead-outs are about to start. You can see the lead-out on the right-hand side. That is Armiga Farmer Lotto. They're looking after their man, uh, and that, of course, is Jürgen Vandenbroek, who starts the day in fifth place. Contador has a perfect position as we look here. He's just behind uh, the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck. Now, there's a lot of different colored jerseys at the front today. And you're right, Paul. There's the white jersey of the world champion, Cadell Evans. Maybe a big test for Cadell now. Juan Manuel Garate moving up over on the right-hand side for Rabobank. He's looking after Denny Menshoff and Robert Hessink, the best young rider in this race so far. This is going to be... You, you cannot imagine how important it is to start this climb. More important, I think, than any climb we've hit so far in the Tour de France, to hit this climb in the top ten, because it's a narrow climb, and if you hit the climb in 30th place, you could find yourself 20 seconds behind already. Absolutely, because you've virtually got to queue up to get into the narrow roads in Monde before you can get onto the climb. The climb itself isn't a huge problem. Problem, except the, the gradient is it is very very steep and, and it's the steeper than any of the climbs we've seen in the Alps and of course no alike as long we've just entered now the uh, end town of Mond we're heading into the narrow streets with the four leaders but we are less than a minute spread across the board now these four leaders are now trying to get up to the front. The remnants of the breakaway is about to be swept up by the peloton in the distance. And we're coming into a very narrow town with some tricky turns before we get onto the climb itself. It's going to be a bit chaotic when the main field catches that 12-man chasing group because they'll have to keep themselves organised. They want to go by them as quickly as possible to keep the front end of the main field nice and clean. This is Yaroslav Popovich who's come up now, looking over his shoulders. He wants to make sure that Levi Leipheimer is well placed at the start of the climb, but he's lost him. He's looking back, saying, Levi, where are you? Come up here and get on my wheel. I'll get you into the first ten positions. But there's about ten different teams trying to do exactly the same tactic here, Phil. Get their men into the top ten going around the first corners of this climb, the Monte Laurent Jalabert. Well, Popovich has gone down the line to look for Levi, I think. Levi is not very confident on the climb today. He says it's really not his style. It's an explosive climb. All he can do is suffer all the way up and hope it all comes out. And there's a lot of riders thinking that right now. Confident or not, he has to start at the front. It is imperative to start this climb right at the front. That's still Mario Ertz at the front end of the main field. We're in the heart of the town of Mond now. That banner indicates five kilometres to go to the top. Three and a half of those, Phil, are uphill. Yes, and we're very close to the to the left and right flicks as we go through the, the wall city as it is just up here. Not a real city, this is a big town. And these are the four leaders. They'll get the first look at it. Ryder Hezerdahl, been a real champion of the tour today. The Canadian is uh, trying for a high position as we go down towards the Pyrenees. Just starts to bite a little as we go down the main street. This street was totally closed off last night for celebrations of the arrival of the Tour de France. Big festivities in the town yesterday. Cloden still setting the pace on the right-hand side there in the red jersey, followed by Kirienka, now followed by Alexander Vinokurov, and coming up into fourth position, Ryder Hazardal. They are going now through a wall of noise. They've left all of the difficulties of the stage behind them. There is only one difficulty left. It's the final climb of the day, and what a cloud. We're in the middle of France, we're in the middle of nowhere, and everybody's turned out to see the tour today. And a lot of these people, if not half of them, live here in Monde. Now that's one of the left turns there now. And as we get around the next corner, it really does start to get very, very steep indeed. The right turn now. We're on the final climb here, and already Hazardal is in trouble. The cameras don't really show you how steep these roads are. We go right up the trees in front in a, a rather terrifying, uh, hair-pinning series of climbs. And Hazardal, he's done a lot of work today, Paul. He's paying. Well, he's paid the price there, and this at the front is Alessandro Pataki doing the pacemaking, and this that. is a bit of a shock to me. Also notice Andreas Cloden was in difficulty here, number 24. He can't stay in contact with Kirienka just up the front there and Alexander Vinokurov, but I think that's all going to be secondary because they'll all be present with the main field very shortly. 
Well, there is the move. Kirienka, so narrowly beaten the other day by Paulinho, has now got rid of everybody except the little limpid himself, Alexander Vinukarov. He is going to try and ride. These two I don't think will be caught, but I shouldn't say that at 32 seconds because it is quite possible now. The Norwegian flags fly. I can't believe Pataki. Well, he isn't. He, he just cracked. No, he hasn't. He's brought uh, this man, Damiano Kunigo, to the front of the bunch. He was thinking about the Petit Prince, the little man from uh, Italy, to try and get a finish for him. This is an ideal finish for a guy like Kunigo. If he can stay in contact here, he's got the kind of sprint to finish it off. Well, I think Cloden did go back for, uh, for Levi Leipheimer to try and bring him up here now because the climbers have got to have the day. There's going to be a lot of boys who are going to throw it at each other now. There are those that don't actually race for yellow but are going to cause trouble if they can. I would guess that move there was coming from John Gadre of AG2R. There's the world champion, Cadell Evans, in the fifth position, looking very comfortable right now. Andreas Cloden, uh, sorry not to Levi Leipheimer, is now coming up into the second front half of the peloton. It looks like Gadre, his legs are rather thin, that's a good clue. As he tries now to dance away from these boys, but it's not against racing each other who's in front. As far as they're concerned with Schleck and Contador, it is matching each other and either trying to gain or not lose seconds. Well, but Kirienka and Vinokurov are locked together on the slopes of this climb. You get an idea now, Phil, to see just how oh. steep this climb is. In these corners, it's not 11%, it's closer to 13%, especially on the inside of the bend. And the crowd are appreciating this at the arrival of the Tour de France here. They put the airport on a plateau overlooking the town, 1,400 feet above it. And Lance Armstrong, no reason to race for big time now. His tour is done as far as overall is concerned, saving his energy for another day when maybe he'll go hunting for the stage. Well, this is the damage done at the back by this climber, the Monte Laurent Jalabert, but the race is really on at the front where we've got two leaders. The two leaders are still, of course, the men who have really attacked the foot of this climb, Andreas Cloden and Vasily Kirienka. The damage done now because the peloton have hit it at full-on speed. They had no choice. Cadell Evans is sneaking up the inside. Is he going to try and stretch them out? He's lost enough time not to counter his move yet. Well, locked onto the wheel of the yellow jersey is Alberto Contador. Evans has moved up into second or third position. That's an indication that he's starting to feel that little bit better. It's a bridge too far here, I think, for John Gadre. He's got himself two metres 50 off the front end of the main field. And in fact, it's one of the teammates of Matty Lloyd who's come to the front end of the race for Omega Farmer Lotto. That's Daniel Moreno, the Spanish rider, a very good climber in his own right. Looking after Jürgen Vandenbroek, his teammate here. Vandenbroek fighting for the high finish for Belgium. Best place to the Belgian cyclist. A top 10 would be the best result for many, many, many years. Gadre continues. The gap isn't really coming down to those leaders. Now they're free to fly. They're heading up towards three kilometers to go. And Vinokurov has shed Kirienka. When you look over your shoulder, you're cooked. And Kirienka looked over his shoulder. So now Alexander Vinokurov is free to fly. Hot to trot, a stage win on the horizon. He's now going under the banner of three kilometers to go. He's popped Vasily Kirienka off his wheel. And this is the moment that he's been waiting for. Ryder Hezjedal is about to get absorbed by the front end of the main field and all of the heads of state of the Tour de France are still present and correct. Nobody has yet launched a move off the front end of the peloton. But Alexander Vinokurov may well have the move here, which indicates to me Alberto Contador, Phil, if he thinks Vinokurov can win the stage, won't make a move. Well, Vinokurov who disgraced himself in the Tour de France by changing his blood. He served the suspension, he's come back. He thanked the organisation for allowing him back in the race. Now we presume he's riding totally clean here as he continues up the climb. Three kilometres to go now for the whole peloton. It is a total scramble. Well, Mick Rogers just holding on to the back step of this bus here, a bus which has been rapidly reduced in numbers. He's over there on the right-hand side going slightly backwards. Luis Leon Sanchez, 161. Nicholas Roach, number 81. Bradley Wiggins, number 31. The big names, Phil, they're all coming to the back. It's like that big distillery once again. Well, this is really a shame for Team Sky, but they are not really in this race at the moment. Wiggins is now in big trouble once again. The pressure put on him, I think, to try and win the Tour. 
has just exploded his legs completely. He's lost his morale. Well, Carlos Sastra was right at the back end of that group. Joachim Rodriguez is over there. He's looking very dangerous, and he's a man who knows how to perform well on the slopes of a climb like this. This is the man that everybody thought might have a crack today. Number 91, Carlos Sastra. Robert Kessig is in the group in the white jersey. Well, in the background there, that walking bottle is the clean bottle guy, and I have to tell you that that bottle he advertises, he's invented. It unscrews at both ends so he can wash them and use them all again. Here's Alberto Contador, still riding alongside now, still looking good, gazing around, almost stargazing there, as he sits on the side of the yellow jersey. These two boys, Paul, seem to be just riding the mountain and they're not attacking. Well, I think Alberto Contador is not going to make a move here this afternoon because of the fact that he's got Alexander Vinokurov in the front. He won't make a move to try and damage the possibility of getting a stage victory for Team Astana. Check that for a face of pain. This man now has got to do all kinds of things to pull himself inside out. Andreas Cloden is still surviving off the front end of the main field. He's about to make contact here with Vasily Kirienka. And will he go straight by him? I think he might. Well, if he can get straight by him, of course, they might well steal the team lead because Radio Shack and Case de Palm are almost equal on time. And it could well be a reversal of that as we now see an attack by Katusha. Joachim Rodriguez, this is a man who's got a very good chance of getting the victory. This is his kind of climb. And Phil, he's far enough down, I think, for them to let him go. They don't need to respond. He started the day in ninth position overall. Well, a typical man for the move indeed, jo Joaquim Rodriguez. Well, look at this, Contador is gone, and he's a little bit slow to react here. Well, everything Paul was just saying, completely reversed. Contador has gone, and now we expect a reaction here from Andy Schleck. If he loses time on this climb to Contador, I think he'll lose the tour. Well, Andy Schleck has just sat down in the saddle. He tried the acceleration to get across. He's leapt across to Joaquim Rodriguez here, looking over his shoulder. He's got the face of concentration. He's a rounder about five or six hundred meters to the top of the climb he's catching all of the riders in front of him there's Kirienka there is Andreas Cloden and he's gonna go again the man who wears number one well Rodriguez needs to jump onto the train of Contador here because they're coming towards the summit of the climb but there's still a little bit of a slope left and this is a surprise I never thought we'd see Andy Slick not react to that I'm not so sure he can but there's still time look at Jürgen Vanderbroek Jürgen Vanderbroek 101 the leader of Omega Farmer Lotto knows that he's got a chance here of pulling himself up into third place overall at the end of the day but you know what Andy Schleck has not given up the ghost just yet two kilometers to go to the finish but it's only about a kilometer to go to the top and we kind of forgotten hadn't we Alexander oh. Vinokurov is still surviving by 19 seconds ahead of Claude and Kirienka but it's now been changed to Contador Joachim Rodriguez well in the times we've come here and seen uh, people uh, like uh, Laurent Jalabert when we never saw crowds like this they are enormous the Tour de France can continues to grow in popularity and look at the catches coming he's come right up to him so now Contador has been joined by Vinokurov and Rodriguez these boys are dancing away from the peloton and very soon it'll level out Vinokurov is doing everything he can now to find a bit of extra energy while further down the slope Andy Schleck is doing exactly the same thing oh. at the start of the day Phil he had a 41 second advantage over Alberto Contador he's losing a little bit of that just now Alberto Contador knows the finishing line. He gave us every reason to believe he would not bother today, but he's taken it off his own teammate. Rodriguez is hanging in, but you know, 41 seconds can be out the window in a matter of a kilometre. Andy Schleck has got to get deep, deep down into that pain threshold. Right on his wheel, Jürgen Vanderbroek, Sammy Sanchez was there as well. They're just about to crest the top of the climb here. I've got a funny feeling, you know, we may well get a victory by Joachim Rodriguez here because there's no reason for Alberto Alberto Contador to win, he might need some allies a little bit further down in the road. The crowd just stretches and stretches from the town of Mond onto the airfield itself. Once they level, they'll turn left onto the runway, and at the speed they're going, there's a very good chance they're going to take off. Well, uh, they need to take off because this same runway here looks like an aircraft carrier. Alberto Contador looking back over his shoulders to see what time of gap he's got. But Andy Schleck has not given up yet, Phil. He's going to fight all the way no, to the finish. It. Just in front of him there is Alexander Vinokurov. They are over the top of the climb. It's now eyes down for the flat ride to the finishing line here. Time trialing might uh, be the, the strength of Contador. It's not of Andy Schleck. Rodriguez knows that Contador is racing for time, yet he's still going to help him. 
Well, he's shaking his head a bit. I'm sure that Joachim Rodriguez will do whatever he can to work with the, the, his compatriot there at the front end of the main field. He realizes Contador needs time, and Joachim Rodriguez wants a stage victory out of this. There's some pretty serious men in this group, too, because not only in that group was uh, the Jürgen Vandenbroek, but also in the group just sitting on the back was Sammy Sanchez and Denny Menshoff. Well, this little select group here is played, contained the white jersey there of uh, Guessing and Leipheimer, but this is the race now. The clock will start as soon as we swing onto the runway. There's the runway. We are now taxiing for the finishing line here, all the way up the road into a headwind. And Alberto Contador keeps looking at Rodriguez. Rodriguez has no reason to hit him. He's going to follow him and try and beat him in the sprint. And he can sprint, Rodriguez. Well, he's a great sprinter. I've seen him win stages in Paris Nice. He's onto the wheel of Contador. Contador actually wants this win, and they've both opened up the sprint. Opened up to go. Now, Rodriguez is going for the win here, but is uh, Contador going for yellow? Little look over his shoulder. Rodriguez gets the victory. Alberto Contador is in second place here. And Vinder Kulov a little upset set with third place the time will not be enough though van der Broek comes home with the maillot jaune but contador has taken back about 11 seconds well that's going to make him 30 seconds behind andy schleck in the overall stand there's levi leipheimer coming in at about 18 seconds this climb phil once again has split the race to pieces here's the next group this is damiano kunigo bradley wiggins trying to survive luis leon sanchez is in there and cadell evans well it's good to see wiggins suffer like that as he did on Monbon 2 and he finished fourth in the Tour de France last year. The face of Michael Rogers coming up towards the line at the moment. It is a tough day for them all. It has been just a scramble up the hill here in Mont. There's Kirienko, the man who was in the breakaway all day. He's come in 48 seconds adrift. Mickey Rogers now looking for 53 seconds with Hazardal. And just on the back of that group as well, it looked as if it was uh, Nicolas Roach. Well, Rodriguez in his first Tour de France has won his first ever stage in this race. Uh, it was a short uphill finish for him. Here's Sylvain Chabanel bringing home a small group of four men. Just on the back of the group, Christophe Moreau, a good ride up the climb by him. It's going to be interesting to count back the Radio Shack performance here, Phil, because I have a feeling that Team Case de Pine will have extended their lead in the team race. Well, as they come home, all this damage has been created in the last four kilometres of the day. Unbelievable. As you look out across the... Uh, the range here of the department of the Lozère, and it's all been enacted on the top of it. Joaquin Rodriguez is the winner today's stage, just on five hours of cycling for him today. He's outspinned Contador, the only rider who will get in in the same time. Vinokurov just lost four seconds. He wasn't happy about being caught by his teammate either and taking third place, but he had his chance. Jürgen van der Broek continues to show us he is a man for Belgium. Fourth for him. Andy Schleck concedes 10 seconds, so his lead tonight will be 31. Sam Sanchez in sixth, of course, he'll hold third. Andreas Kloden in seventh, he'll move up a little bit. Menchov should hold on his high position in eighth. Top 10 completed by Roman Kreuziger. Well, this is the way that he made that move. He was in the right position. He was alongside there, uh, Ivan Basso in the lime green. Uh, Andy Schleck knew he had to go with this. This was the steepest part of the climb, and Andy Schleck all of a sudden sat down in the saddle. He saw the move, he looked at it and said, right, I've got to go with this man because this, of course, is Alberto Contador. There, a little bit further up the road, Contador made a magnificent performance. He caught every rider one by one on his way up towards the finishing line. But the big move really was Joachim Rodriguez. The face of Andy Schleck, well, it doesn't look like a face of complete pain. But watch out there on the left-hand side, Denny Menshoff never went anywhere. He sat in contact with everyone for the whole of the day. No real change in the overall standings apart from the time. Andy Schleck and Contador now separated by 31 seconds. Sanchez is still third. Menshoff fourth, Vandenbroek fifth. So there's no difference there in the uh, top, just looking briefly. Joaquin Rodriguez comes in into eighth position. So the top five there remain the same, but the gaps are closed down a little bit. But Contador, certainly the winner today. He's closed in now to within 31 seconds of Andy Schleck. As the peloton speeds here over this river Tarn, the breakaway is just on four minutes ahead. It's been out to six minutes. Uh, Pierre Fedrigo, Sylvain Chabanel, Juan Antonio Fletcher of Sky. It's really good to see Sky now uh, get some confidence here by putting a man in the break. But it wasn't meant to be. Paul Sean Yates there said that um, they had no plans to put a man in a break today in the end. But when he got in there, he said he decided not to call him back. 
Well, he's the right man to have in the break, especially when you look at the composition of that breakaway. Sylvain Chavanel, two stage wins in the Tour de France so far. Peric Federigo, he's won two stages previously in Tours de France, and Fletcher would oh, be the man to go with them. But you can just see how much pressure is on this race, and getting dropped at 75 kilometers to go is not a good sign. No, and uh, I'm not sure who that was. It could have been Christoph Kern of the Cofferdis team. They're having a bit of a rough ride now, Cofferdis. They've lost the climber today in the rain at Tarame, he abandoned. Yesterday we lost the smallest man in the race, Samuel Dumoulin, also Cofidis. And uh, now they've got another man in difficulty. But HTC are confident today with Cavendish for sure. I've got to say, though, Phil, that uh, Tony Martin on the front is a bit of a beast there. He's uh, blowing guys out of the back end of this main field just with the pressure that he's extending onto the peloton on his own. And here you can see the, the nodding heads of the riders at the back end of the main field, and that's because the pressure is on. The chase is starting to happen, and it's going to be a long, hard chase because, as I said earlier, these three riders in the breakaway, Chavanel, Federigo, and Fletcher, are seasoned campaigners, and they are men that you don't allow to get too far off the front end of the main field. But certainly the teams of the sprinters are looking to make this a, a final day for their men before we go into the big mountain passes. Tomorrow, it'll be a different ball game as we go up to Axley Trois Domaine, a very big ski resort up in the Pyrenees above Axley Terme. Pressure's going out of this uh, leading trio a bit. They're uh, all of a sudden starting to say, ouch, this climb is starting to hurt the little climb of Puy Laurence. Well, the whole area is up and down, as we found out when we drove through this area last night. We didn't go through Puy Laurence, but we saw it on the signboard. We took the most direct way to Ravel. If you can find it, it's not easy because it is just a, a complete uh, a, a maze, maze of lanes. The whole, the whole area is terrific for cycling when you're not in the Tour de France. Not the easiest part of France to uh, commute across from stage finish to stage finish, though, no. because it took us an awful long, la a long, a long time last night to get from Monde all the way down here to the finish line in Ravel. And actually, there is no direct route, unless you want to take the motorway, which is around about 500 kilometres around. Yes, um, I have to say, I take my hat off to all our technicians because they, they drive these big Pantechnicum vehicles, and they were arriving at our hotel at 2.30 in the morning and having to be up and away from the hotel to set it all up for us by 5.30, three hours sleep. Yep, and, uh, they do that every day. A lot of people think there are two teams in the Tour de France and they leapfrog forward. Well, no, there is only one team. There's one set of barriers, there's one podium, and there's one set of uh, television uh, buses which goes ahead every day just as we do. Yeah, it's an incredible event, setting up uh, what is in virtually a, a FIFA World Cup venue every day of the Tour de France throughout the three weeks. The riders, they get it easy. They just go home, have a good meal, a massage, bed by nine o'clock. Yeah, I don't know why they're worrying myself. I don't think this man's worrying at all. He's having probably, I would say, his best Tour de France since he turned professional back in the year 2000. And uh, maybe a lot of it's to do with the fact that he had an accident in the early part of the year and he didn't ride quite as often as he normally would have done. I'm not sure if he'll go out and try and get himself points here. It's not really important for these guys. None of them are really high up in the standings. I suppose apart from Chavanel, who was in the breakaway on the long day to Poe, and he's probably in the first uh, six or seven yeah. in the King of the Mountains he's got a, But he's so many points behind. He's quite a long way behind, actually. So, No, but he is on the same team as Jerome Pino, so he'll try to steal the points, as will Federigo, because Federigo's on the team of the current leader, Chateau. So they'll take the points and put them in their own bank, just in case, I would think. Well, in that case, it uh, looks like it's Fletcher. Nope, Savinel's decided to put a little bit of extra pressure on. In fact, I just quickly looked down at the standings, and he started the day in 11th place. He was about 70 points behind Anthony Chateau and about uh, 60 points behind his own teammate, Jérôme Pinot. So his points there garnered at the top of this climb are not really going to make any difference at all in that classification, which is still being led with three Frenchmen in the top four in that competition. Anthony Chateau leads ahead of Jérôme Pinot, and in fourth place, Christophe Moreau, at 39 years of age, has got 62 points. So three points for Chavanel at the top, ahead of uh, Pedrigo and Juan Antonio Fletcher of Spain and of Team Sky. They're looking now at around about 70 kilometers to go, but the gap is now starting to come down. It's hovering at three and a half minutes. There's the peloton, and still the men with the sprinters, a familiar tale, and everybody thought this would not be a sprinter's paradise today. It would be a breakaway, and it looks as though if they time it, as they so often do, it will be a sprint today, and the finish is a good finish for a sprinter. 
No, it certainly is. It's a great finisher over the last two to three kilometers of the race on the run-in, but it is a bit tricky as they circumnavigate Ravel. Well, I suppose you could say sunflower seeds galore here in this part of France. This is very typical view of the, uh, the southern part of France, especially at this time of the year. And it is always amazing to see the tournesol, as it's called in French. It turns towards the sun, and it certainly has done here, as you can see, the main field. Not really getting much of a chance to enjoy the views that we're seeing from the helicopter and the motorbike this afternoon, because they're putting together a very serious chase. These are the narrow rows today, and normally this is a perfect course for a breakaway. But the Tour de France and the cyclists in the Tour de France, they decide when it's a perfect course, and nobody else. Now, Juan Antonio Fletcher is calling up Sean Yates here, manager of the Sky Team. Probably wants a drink. I think that's all he wants to do at the moment, keeping himself uh, topped up with as many liquids as possible. The other day, one of the French riders took on board 17 individual bottles. I can't believe he drank all of those, because that's about eight and a half litres. I suppose a couple of those litres were poured over the top of him to keep himself nice and cool. That's a lot of weight, too. A long line of plane trees, and we call them plantain trees here in France, and uh, they have a particular way they prune them and let them shoot again. And uh, as you can see, they look... Uh, extremely nice. There's the arm of possibly Sean Yates. I don't know who's in the car today, but I think it's Sean driving. And so we might get a little peek. No, we're not going to get a peek. All right. But Juan Antonio Fletcher, he signed up for Sky this year. Uh, he was on the Rabobank team. Now he's having to race against his mates in those orange jerseys on the right of our picture. 325, 65 kilometers still to go, but a very, very healthy pace today, Paul. Just look at these boys, they're moving. They certainly are. I mean, we're, we're very consistently riding at uh, 50 to 55 kilometers an hour. It's going to be a long, hard chase because, as I said earlier, the three men in the breakaway are very seasoned professionals, and they are tough characters, too, who will be hard to pull back. Although, when you see how many riders are organizing the chase at the front end, I'd have to say their chances of survival are possibly as high as 1%. As high as that? Yeah. Right. Well, that's only being kind. OK. Well, we'll see. We're heading towards the town of uh, Coupe-Toulza as the riders speed through the plantain trees. And uh, very soon, they'll be entering the department of the Oak Garon, but we will switch briefly back into the town before we finally finish in the Oak Garon. It's a tough course for these guys. There's no respite at all on this stage, and there's really not any flat at all, but it is a slightly easier ride through the haute garonne than the ride through the uh, Lozère yesterday, when I would say there was a number of riders who were very happy to get to the end of the stage. Just looking down, we uh, got a chance to ride through some magnificent fields this afternoon, the fields of the sunflower seeds, which are really abundant in the southern part of France here. We're now uh, looking to go through the next town on the race route, which is the town of puy le -Rance. This is Maxime Montfort doing all of his pacemaking on the front end of the main field. And as you can see, they get a chance to get some respite once again from uh, the shadow, the shade produced here by these plane trees. France has got the red, white and blue, hoping that they can get themselves another victory. This has been a very successful Tour de France for France this year, and that, that's not always the case. And there have been years when the French have not even taken out an individual stage at all. Sometimes they've had to be happy with just one stage. But this year uh, they've had two stage victories onto the back of this man here, Sylvain Chavanel. They've had the yellow jersey on two occasions. And, of course, they're currently leading the King of the Mountains classification with Anthony Chateau, who took it away from Sylvain Chavanel's teammate, Jérôme Pinot, yesterday. Another game. This is another slight climb here, but, again, this climb is not even uh, on the race route as a profile. It's uh, just a little lump in there you parkour around here. Tomorrow's stage takes the riders into the, the Pyrenees, and then we stay in the Pyrenees for some huge battles. This year, the Tour de France is celebrating its 100th anniversary of the inclusion of the Pyrenees in the Tour, and they're going to spend four very difficult days, with the final two days are going over the big climb of the Col de Tourmalet. In fact, they go over the Col de Tourmalet on the, the day before the rest day and finish down in Po. The next day after the rest day, they leave Po to climb back up it, and the finish is right on the top making it the final climb of the Tour de France this year. So, Chavanel 
Very happy to set the pace, me. He's got incredible form. I've rarely seen Chavanel ride like this. He did change, I have to say, though, as a bike rider when he left uh, the Cofidis team where he'd raced for a number of seasons and move across to Quickstep. He said the reason he wanted to move across to the Belgian team was he wanted to learn how to ride the one-day classics, and he did it to a fair amount of success because he was a serious ally last year to Tom Bonin when Tom Bonin won last year the uh, great race Tour of Flanders. Moving up the outside, that's uh, that's Sant Ambrogio there, number 129, a teammate of Cadell Evans, just sitting on the back here, number 54, Ryder Hazedal. I should think his legs are quite uh, singing this afternoon because he was in a very long breakaway yesterday, only caught on the final couple of kilometres of the climb up to Monde. Looking at the front end of the main field, you can see that little group of riders forming, and in that group of riders is this man, Alberto Contador. He took a psychological advantage yesterday over Andy Schleck by jumping away from the Luxemburger in the final few uh, meters of the race to gain a uh, 10 seconds. There's Levi Leipheimer. He rides as high as sixth place in the overall standings, formerly a teammate of Alberto Contador a couple of years ago. In fact, when Alberto Contador won the Tour de France for the first time, well, Levi Leipheimer finished third and he was a teammate at the time. Robert Gessink in the white jersey. He's a, an exceptionally good young rider, but he's actually in second place in this competition. The competition is currently being led by Andy Schleck. Uh, Robert Gessink is in seventh place at the start of the day, 4.27. Rabobank could actually have quite a lot to play in the Pyrenees because they've got two riders in the top seven. Denny Menshoff, the rider we saw just a few moments ago, he started the day in fourth place. Most aggressive rider of yesterday gets the red number on his back, and that is Alexander Vinokurov. Ouch, actually, I had ignored the time gap for a couple of seconds there, and all of a sudden, from uh, three minutes, it's down to two minutes and 15 seconds. Third place overall for the former Spanish champion and the Olympic gold medalist from Beijing, Sammy Sanchez. You can see all the big names here actually riding at the front end of the main field. They're being extremely attentive, uh, and I think because of the fact that they're somewhat concerned about uh, the possibility of the wind wreaking havoc on the running towards the finish. Once we get away from these uh, few little ripples around the outskirts of uh, Revel, the race actually starts to uh, open up and there's not so much vegetation around and there is a fair amount of wind and we did see a couple of days ago on the run into Valence that in fact uh, Team Saxo Bank tried to split the race to pieces and they may well try and use a similar kind of tactic to try and put some time between themselves and Alberto Contador. That's probably the only place where Alberto Contador is vulnerable. And somebody was analyzing uh, his riding in the crosswinds and saying that there's a possibility that uh, the fact that he gets a little bit scared in situations like this goes back to the fact that he had a very nasty accident a number of years ago where he actually crashed and fractured his skull. That's Leipheimer, the new leader of Team Radio Shack, and now with the demise of Lance Armstrong, who I have to say has had all of the bad luck of all of his career thrown into one single Tour de France. And there is the evergreen Stewie O'Grady. There he is. He's uh, probably quite happy today as well by the fact that uh, a lot of the teams of the sprinters are doing the work, meaning he doesn't have to. So there we go. Mark Cavendish wears 111. The boys have their orders today to take him to the finish if they can. The gap is down to 208. He never looks happy at this stage of the race, but it's all going pretty well. Go on, Mark, give us a give us a smile. He's telling you talking to Bernard Eisel to move over there. Yeah, well, I think Bernie Eiselfill is going to have to be the lead-out man for Mark Cavendish now, and Bernie Eisel himself was an exceptionally good sprinter in the early part of his career. Mm -hmm. He spent a long time riding for the Francaise de Jeu, and I was... Uh, I think his career actually changed when he moved from the French team to go across to T-Mobile and then HTC Columbia. And since then, he's become an integral part of this team and a big part of Mark Cavendish's lead-out. I think you're absolutely right. Isil's 29 years of age now. He's still a young man in world cycling terms. 24 wins to his career, and he's a winner in his own right because this year he probably got his best ever win. It was the Gemp Wavergum Belgian Classic race. Uh, and a great win for him, and he was pretty pleased with that. But he's a stage winner in races like the Tour of Switzerland, the Tour of the Algarve, where he's won on a couple of occasions there. That's in Portugal, of course. We won a stage of the Tour of Switzerland last year, but he is he is a great sprinter. And I think that was a very good win in Gent Wevelgem for him in the early part of this year, and I think uh, he really did enjoy getting that victory. 
208. If you look in the distance, so we can just see peeping around the corner. The peloton can see these three now, so they know exactly where they are. They're looking a little bit despondent now as they're hearing conversations from the team car there. They look as though they might have lost a little bit of firepower up there just now. Christian Keniz at the back. And these guys a little bit later on will be called forward to look after the interests of uh, their big sprinter. And that, of course, is Gerard Cholik. Well, we just come out of the meanderings of the Tarn department now because we're heading on into the area of Oak Garon. We're not quite there yet. And these boys are chasing them down. No, but it's a, it's a long chase, and it's a chase that will have to continue in earnest to try and pull back the trio at the front end of the race. And it's down to just two minutes with 55 kilometres to go. That's about 33 miles of racing. The uh, three leaders, let's not forget, Sylvain Chavanel of France with two stage victories at the Tour so far under his belt. Uh, for, that's this year, plus one a couple of seasons ago. Peric Federigo with two stage victories in his career at the Tour de France. And the other man in the breakaway, Juan Antonio Fletcher, the Argentinian-born rider from, uh, from Sky. As we go to the back of the main field, and there is uh, Cadell Evans. Cadell uh, didn't ride too badly yesterday, and uh, you can still see on his left arm there, he's uh, sporting a, a bandage, and he's got a slight hairline crack in his elbow. Uh, the team doctor is saying that the only thing about that is not a, a dangerous crack that he's got, but it's an extremely painful one. He has a hard time actually holding on to the bars and getting out of the saddle. But he is hoping to ride himself a little bit up higher in the overall standings once this race gets up into the mountains. And I, I think that this could be a rather strange ride through the mountains. Four very difficult days in the Pyrenees to celebrate the Tour de France's inclusion of the Pyrenean mountains in the Tour for the first, for the, since 1910. A little bit of slowing there. Once you see the main field bunch up like that, that's an indication that they've slowed down a fraction at the front end of the main field. Sylvain Chavanel. He knows what to expect. He knows they're coming back, but he's never going to give up. They, when he was in a breakaway on the road to Spa in Belgium, he was in a breakaway and he knew they were coming back at him, and everybody with him dropped back. He stayed and stuck to his guns, and he won. And that was the day that the riders went on strike over the slippery roads coming down the Côte de Stocker. And so he stayed away and he won, and he won by a small time gap over the field, which didn't sprint for second place, you may recall. So just looking there, it's, it's amazing to see this team HTC Columbia Phil. They just get it into their heads that they've got to sit at the front end of the main field. And uh, I actually thought they might have had a, a day off today and said, no, we, we don't want to chase anymore. We've had too much of a hard time chasing since the start. And they may well have allowed uh, the uh, breakaway to succeed. But I think they were inspired by seeing they got some help and assistance from Team Lamprey. And that's why they've decided to keep the pressure on at the front end of the main field. Well, as we continue to spread around, this is Saint Paul Cap de Joux, which is, uh, I'm not sure it's a cathedral, it's a church or what it is down there. It's a fortified, uh, it's a fortified chateau which uh, dates back to originally the 1200s. So as we continue to spin around the beauty of the, the uh, tar, make the most of it because in the next six or seven kilometres we change counties, we go into the Oak Garonne. I'm on meander through there now, which is equally as beautiful, of course. The Tour de France still has three men up front. HTC Columbia on the front, and they really are applying the tourniquet now and trying to bring these boys back to the fold. Well, if you can see the German national champion there, the white jersey with the bands across, just behind him is Robbie McEwen. And I might have done Robbie McEwen a bit of a disservice just a little earlier because I said he never really had a lead out train. Well, I suppose you could go back to around about 2005 and 6 when Freddy Rodriguez, the American, rode alongside uh, Robbie McEwen and he had to lead him out. He had Freddy, Freddy Rodriguez and Herd Stegemanns. But they never really seem to have the big power of the lead out like HTC Columbia or the Lamprey squad when they get themselves organized to really bring Alessandro Pataki to the front. No, it wasn't exactly a lead out train, it's just the front end of the locomotive, I think, in those days. Anyway, we might see Robbie here now as we drop back. We certainly see Lance Armstrong. He's just peeping into the right there. There he is in the blue top to his jersey. He'll never be far away from the action. He knows there's going to be a sprint finish today. And Robbie's been knocking on the door. He's had a couple of fourth places, and uh, for him, if he could get a victory in uh, what might be his final Tour de France, uh, what a way to go out of the sport. He's had a tough year this year, though, Phil, with injuries, trying to get himself uh, back onto the top of his game. That was Luke Roberts. A lot of Australians in the Tour de France this year. Yes, Luke's in his third tour. 
and uh, looking very concentrated. He's not had to do much yet, and you probably won't like me saying that uh, for his teammate Jello Johnny just now, but he now does because he knows he can win today. Yep, I think all of the sprinters are looking at the possibility of a victory this afternoon. They realize that uh, from uh, tomorrow onwards, they're going to have to take a very serious uh, back seat because it will be uh, passing a race over to the uh, land of the climbers. This uh, is Levi Leipheimer. You can see the lime green jersey, the number of jerseys that he's got there. That's because uh, Team Radio Shack took the overall lead in the team classification yesterday away from Case Stepania. They lead that competition by 21 seconds. That's a competition that takes the time of the first three riders in your team on every individual stage. That gets added up together, and that gives you your position in the team classification. Just uh, dragging Levi Leipheimer back up through the field there is the Kazakh rider on the squad, Dmitry Muravyev. So the three leaders, uh, they've just come inside the two-minute mark. Uh, Sylvain Chavanon is very happy to keep setting the pace every now and again. We get a, a time check on the, what work has been done by these riders over the last 10 minutes of the race. And in fact, it uh, is usually around about 30% each. It's Tony Martin at the front, just behind him is... Uh, the former world time trial champion, and that's uh, the very, very aggressive Bert Grabsch. Uh, funny old time, really, for Bert Grabsch, because his brother, Ralph Grabsch, is the team manager for Team Mil Milram. Mike Pimer, he's in the back with the, in the team cars, trying to make his way back into contact with the front end of the main field. I'm not sure why he had to drop back, but he's obviously got uh, Muraviev just alongside him to make sure it's a nice, easy ride back into the main field. He still believes that he can get himself a, a podium position. Well, in fact, to, to do that, he's looking for around about uh, one and a half minutes on Sammy Sanchez, who sits in third place. But so too does that, that man there, Jürgen Vandenbroek. He is in fifth place uh, overall, and that's uh, the best place for a Belgian for a long, long time in the Tour de France. You have to go back, I think, to, Claude, to Axel Merckx, actually, who finished 10th. Well, look at it. There's a lot of movement down in this peloton now. Riders are repositioning themselves very, very actively now. They're all sensing the kill is around the corner, I think. Interestingly to see, too, that some of the bigger names are moving forward because they know life gets a little bit rough up front once the riders start to hunt down the leaders. Just at the back, uh, big uh, Thomas Lovquist there for Team Sky. He's a strong bike rider from Sweden, and uh, he was well up in the overall standings uh, before the race got into the Alps. Then he slipped down a fraction uh, on the day up to uh, the Station de Russe. Just come back onto the peloton with Levi Leipheimer and with uh, Moriev. They've been out for a natural break, I think. They've sensed now they're getting ready for the hard chase down, bringing back these three riders. Now it's a minute and three quarters. They're closing in quite quickly here. Road systems change a little bit now. We're just about to enter the Haute Garonne. And we'll stay here for about 35 kilometers before we go briefly back into the Tarn before the finish in the Okeron. We circumnavigate Ravel, that's why we changed departments, and we circumnavigate Ravel uh, just so we can go up this little climb here, the Côte uh, saint Ferriol. Yeah, it's a very difficult uh, final uh, 10 kilometres, Phil. They come almost into the town of Ravel, then they go straight out again onto the D629, and then it's that la nasty little climb that takes the riders to the final three kilometres. The final three kilometres, though, are extremely straight and very long which is very good for the sprinters, if that's the way it's going to be. Here we charge through the plantain trees, and at the end of this column of cars, in the far distance there, you can see the peloton now getting them in their sights. Minute and 46 seconds. They've ridden pretty hard. It doesn't appear that they're riding fast when you only see three riders, but just look at the speed of the peloton now, and that tells you the difference. They're holding them off. They are riding very quickly indeed. No, they, they are doing... You can see the gap coming down, 144 as uh, Ivan Basso is on the far side and moving up to the front end of the main field. He's going to have a few words to say, I think, Phil, once we go up into the Pyrenees, because it's going to be a very difficult four days of racing, and it can completely change the top end of the overall standings. And I wonder if Andy Schleck, having lost 10 seconds to Alberto Contador yesterday, is going to try and do something in the Pyrenean stages, because I still believe in the back of my mind he needs a big buffer over Alberto Contador if he wants to dream about taking yellow to Paris. Well, your theory is right, but can he do anything? We'll find out. 
Combine harvester, harvesting the wheat and barley which abound in this area around here as we go back to the front end of the main field. This is uh, Grabsch on the front, followed by Montfort, followed by Luke Roberts, followed by these guys from uh, Lamprey who are doing their pacemaking and they're thinking about Alessandro Pataki. Pataki, that was uh, Matsmaro D'Alto on, on the front for Lamprey there with the in about fourth position. And this is again one of those magnificent avenues of plane trees. Long straight roads for the moment, but once we get closer to Ravel, it becomes very tortuous as we start to uh, circumnavigate. Very often, these trees that we're looking at here can uh, they can actually grow to between 30 and 50 meters in uh, in height, and they're uh, seriously cut down during the winter and they grow back and they sprout very very nicely indeed and they give us these very big long shaded avenues in the southern part of France Chavanel really now starting to get his back into this he's a former time trial champion of France he was second in the time trial championships this year he was beaten by Nicolas Vogondi a little bit of a surprise because Vogondi never really has shown us that he was a great individual time trialist but he's one of those older French riders who really seems to be coming back to form in the autumn of his career. This is the small town of uh, Lubon, Lograguer. And uh, it's a very pretty little village. In fact, uh, a lot of it dates back to the 17th and 18th centuries. And if you get a chance to get right into that, sit, that little town there, there's a lot of half-timbered houses People from this part of the world are known as the Lubonsois. And uh, again, if, if we do get a chance to see it, there's actually a very nice uh, uh, windmill in the town here, which goes back to the 15th century. This is the castle of Lubon Lauragais. It uh, originates back in the 13th century. The main part of the building there, the, more, the residential part of the building, was added on in the 15th and 16th century. It uh, contains four hectares of extremely nice gardens and uh, it was, became private property back in 1825. And the riders themselves now are five kilometres from the Green Jersey Sprint and at a minute 36, I don't think they'll catch up to the leaders, but you never know. So, five kilometers to the sprint, will they get up? It's a minute and 35 and coming down fast. And the motorbike has just been alongside the riders to show them one minute, 20 seconds. Our computer is showing a little bit more than that, but does it matter? One thirty seconds. These boys are on a small climb here. We're heading in now to the village of Caramont, which is where the sprint will be for the last green jersey points out on the course. These boys know, you can't quite see, but just strain your necks down the road there, and I think you will see the head of the peloton being led by HTC Columbia. Well, still a lot of work being done by HTC, but they've got some serious allies this afternoon, and this is Team Lamprey, who are very happy to come to the front. But you can see, just a little bit further back, well, briefly you could see, in fact, there was uh, the Astana squad. They are looking after their man, Alberto Contador. This is the town of Carman that we're entering into. It sounds exceptionally Spanish. We're really getting down towards the... Uh, the Spanish sounding part of France and in fact a lot of the, the French people from this area especially around uh, Toulouse they speak French with a very Spanish accent it's nasty little climb though it's nothing on the uh, ca categorizations for King of the Mountains but it has taken the edge off the speed of the peloton just for the moment still it's Lamprey the team of Alessandro Pataki setting the pace along with the team of Mark Cavendish HTC Columbia well, I have to say this year, Phil, in the Tour de France, Pataki sprinting has come back to what it was in the 2003-2004. He really has. The two sprints that he's won have been won on sheer power, just as he used to in the old days. Very much the same kind of sprinting as the great sprinter that we used to enjoy commentating on, Mario Cipollini. Yes, what a great sprinter he was, too. He won 12 stages of the Tour de France. We never, ever saw Paris. 
never uh, finished the race, did he? He had a bit of an allergy to the high mountains, and in fact, I'm uh, wondering whether or not Alessandro Pataki will try and get himself round this time, because he too, in fact, yeah. a couple of years ago, it was 2003, he won four stages on the trot. He had the green shirt jersey on his shoulders, and he uh, got into the climbs around the, the foothills of the Alps, and he just had to pull off at the side of the road. That's right, he climbed off wearing the green jersey, didn't he? But he has finished the Tour de France. He finished his first one back in 2001. And uh, he struggled since then to see Paris as well. So, just looking here at uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, the Spanish rider on Team Sky, flying the flag today for the team that's had a pretty, uh, a pretty tough ride in their first Tour de France, but they're learning a lot, and I guess they'll make them a different team next year. Fletcher now getting the six points through the sprint in Caraman ahead of Federigo and Chavanel. Uh, they're not interested in the green jersey competition, but there is 800 euros for the first rider across the line. And that could be quite important, I think, once we come down to the finish, the 35 points. And if Mark Cavendish was to get that 35 points, it would put him uh, in the same number of points as Torhushov today. However, I don't think that Torhushov is going to finish too far outside of the top ten. It's going to be a, a tough call now, but there are other sprinters who are beginning to feel they have a chance. But we're not sure the tactics of Cavendish now. He's lost Mark Renshaw. Feelings very divided on that disqualification of Mark Renshaw a couple of days ago. But either way, he's not here, and, it, and Cavendish has to rethink how he's going to approach the finish today. Well, the team seem to think they know how he's going to do it because they're quite happy to come to the front end of the main field. Just looking there, Phil, at uh, Bert Grabs, just sitting in second position there. He's second last in the overall standings of this race. He doesn't care about his position. He's already two hours and 19 minutes behind in the standings, but he's not the last man overall. The last man overall, though, who in cycling is very often re reformed, re re remarked as the Lantern Rouge, is Anthony Roux of Francais de Jeu. And he's two hours, 19 minutes and 49 seconds. So he's only 49 seconds off Bert Grabsch. There'll be a big battle going on there because uh, we always remember the man that finishes last, but we very rarely remember the man who finishes second to last. So there's always a battle to actually finish last in the Tour de France. Looking down there, that is the town of uh, Caramont, and the church you can see uh, right in the middle is the church of Saint-Pierre. There was a huge battle here, in fact, in the, the 1570s, when the whole of the town was burnt down by the Protestant reformists, and later on, after they were trying to rebuild it, it was destroyed by Henry de Navarre, who uh, went on to become the King Henry IV. Now, and the question now is, will David Navarre... Uh, defend for Contador in the mountains tomorrow. I think he most certainly will because yeah. he was uh, an in in integral part of assassinating the main field on the Col de la, Col de la Madeleine, I'd have to say, Phil, when we went down to Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne. Well, we're passing through the village of Caramont, where the people here are known as Caramonet, as they now move on here, continuing their journey through the Oak Garonne. And these three riders on these perfect roads for an escape today. Round the corner, out of mind, out of sight. Unfortunately, not out of mind just now, the way they're chasing. It's a dead straight one minute now. Nobody in the breakaway is being hunted for his position overall in this race. They've lost far too much time for that. Chavanel is the best placed, but uh, 26 minutes off the, off the race leader. But they were thinking of the stage win, but it seems the sprinters have the same idea. And they've put the, all of their teams on the front now. Milram, Pataki's put his Lamprey team. Cavendish has put HTC Columbia. And again, uh, Tor Hushoff playing the same cards he always plays. He puts nobody on the chase, and he sits there waiting to see how he can make the most of it. Well, his argument is the other sprinters are a lot faster than him. He has got the green jersey filled by right of being extremely consistent on every individual stage. And his, his sprinting ability is much better in the slower, stronger sprints, which are slightly uphill. And in fact, the hill towards the finish may well suit the uh, likes of Tor Hushoff towards the end of the stage. Well, I'm just wondering if somebody will get away on that hill towards the finish. It's only eight kilometres from the end of the day. It could change the whole face and the sprinters may be robbed. Yeah, but I think the, uh, the important thing is that the, these guys, first of all, have got to pull those three riders back into the main field. And uh, that's why we've got uh, Grabsch on the front here. No, Tony Martin, sorry. Hard to see him at that angle. It's Grabsch in second position. 
Mick Rogers has moved up to the front this afternoon, and I think he's all also going to be part of the lead-out train for Mark Cavendish. And if you want to know what it feels like at the back, well, here's a chance to just have a quick look. And these guys are scrambling just to stay in contact with the main field. You see, when you look at them at the front end of the main field, you think, oh, these guys are not really trying all that much. But when you get a chance to see the kind of pressure that's being exerted on the back end of the main field, now look how long that line is. There's probably around about 30 seconds from the first rider to the last rider in this big long line. And I can tell you from experience, these guys are scrambling just to stay in contact with the rider in front of them. And it can be quite dangerous at times because what happens if you overlap a rider and something uh, moves or the road uh, changes shape, then all of a sudden that's how the silly accidents happen. You must never, ever lose concentration in the Tour de France because what has been months, in some cases years of training, it's gone in the blink of an eyelid if you touch a wheel. 58 seconds is the gap. 33.8 kilometers to go. Well, it's great to see that even despite the fact that they know the teams of the sprinters have got a big organized chase, they're still prepared to put their backs into this breakaway with the hope that there is a success. And what they're hoping for is to survive, Phil, to that climb, the final climb of the day, because they reckon that if they can get over that climb, they have a chance of survival. But the way, the methodical way that HTC and Lamprey have been working on the front end of the main field, I would expect to see the catch around about 10 or 15 kilometers to go before they get to the climb. The excitement there on the, on the three spectators on the corner. They've been sat there for ages eating their food and drinking, in the case of those two youngsters, not wine, but probably orange juice. And now they're seeing the moment as the peloton goes by, which is always good to see. But, uh, well, it worked, don't forget, for, um, for, for Chavanel on the road to Spa because the slippery conditions towards the end made the peloton stop chasing and he stayed away. So he's hoping for something like that today, I'm sure. Yeah, but I think if you just keep casting your mind out to the, or casting your eyes to the clock at the top there, 52 seconds, it's continuously going down. And when you look at the length of that main field, there's some serious ravaging going on at the front end of the peloton. They're dishing out a whole load of pain to everybody at the back end of the pack. 32 and a half. We're hitting 55 seconds from the race. We're showing 51 on the screen, so it's a little bit of a reversal here. As uh, Federigo, a stage winner on two occasions, chased by Fletcher, who's won once, chased by Chavanel at the back, who's had three stage wins. So these boys are all experienced in the Tour de France. Yet again, 26 tours between the three of them. These are the men of the tours. They know what the Pyrenees hold tomorrow, and they're not holding anything back for them. 49 seconds, it's saying now. It's reversed again. No, it's just uh, basically uh, steadily starting to come down. It's going in the right direction for the main field, but in the wrong direction for the three-man breakaway. Just looking down at the uh, cultivation at the side of the road there. That is actually, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, this part of the road, this part of uh, the road that we're taking is known as the pastel route, because in fact they grow uh, indigo in this part of the world to make the uh, colour blue. So, Grabs comes to the front. This is Maxime Montfort. He's coming over to make his pacemaking there, relayed there by Luke Roberts. A lot of guys will be thinking uh, there's a possibility of a victory this afternoon. Uh, the big thing for HTC Columbia is they've got to make sure that there are no attacks on that final climb of the day because that final climb of the day is actually ideally situated for a last minute attack. It's seven and a half kilometers to go to the finish, and it's a small climb over San Ferriolo. It's a third category climb. It's two kilometers long with an average gradient of 6%. Just at the back, number 26. And that is uh, Dmitry Muraviev of Team Radio Shack. And you can see the, the panic at the back here. Uh, Adriano Malori was the Lamprey rider sitting right on the back end of the main field. And it's, uh, it's quite good to get the comparison with the riders at the front who who look uh, fairly solid. They don't look as if they're in any kind of difficulty, but when you see the damage that they're doing to the guys at the back, that's all of a sudden that gives you an idea of just how hard this chase has been. It's a long, hard chase after three very well-reputed uh, professional bike riders in the leading trio, Chavanel and Frederigo of France and Juan Antonio Fletcher, the Argentinian-born Spaniard.
in the tournesol this is a beautiful part of france uh, tomorrow for the riders it's a big incursion into the mountains and uh, again a chance for a different kind of rider to come forward and to excel on the way from Ravel, where the riders will start tomorrow they've got a 185 kilometer ride and it goes over a very nasty climb with about 25 kilometers to go the climb, the climb of the Porte de Paez, a climb of 15 and a half kilometers at 8% before finishing the ski resort of actually Trois Domaines. Well, the motorbikes are blocking our view as we look down between these riders here, but I uh, can't see what the young lady is showing them on the board, but it looks as though it's bad news because Chavanel himself had thought, hmm, we better just take a look and see for ourselves. But uh, I think if we're looking at the most aggressive rider of the Tour de France uh, after the whole three week of the event, you'd probably pretty much have to give it to Sylvain Chavanel because he's, he's been out and won two stages. He's got himself the yellow jersey on two occasions and he's still prepared to come out and attack. He seriously has a burning desire, Phil, to win a third stage in the Tour de France this year. He said he would. He said he had no chance overall, so he would continue to try for stages and he's done just that. Luke Roberts has got himself the Australian back on the front. A record number of Australians in the Tour de France at the start this year. And uh, we've lost one or two of them already. Adam Hansen going sadly very early on with a breakage. And uh, that's a big shame for HTC Columbia, that's for sure. Yeah, well, Luke Roberts had a pretty good start to the season, Phil. He finished fifth overall in the Tour Down Under with a brilliant ride, if you remember, yep. over Old Wollonga Hill. Yes, what a wonderful part of the world that is in South Australia, down in the... The wine valley is the Barossa Valley, that one is in. So the three riders are going now, a little bit of movement in them, but they've still got it all to do, and I don't think they can do it. <laughs> Study in motion here of uh, Fletcher on Team Sky. They will not succumb, these boys. They've no intention of lifting the white flag of surrender. 39 seconds, the road keeps changing direction. They're 25 kilometers out from home, and there is the banner. And another huge crowd, Paul. Massive crowd turning out here on the eve, the eve of the Pyrenees, and I think people feel very much are very enjoying seeing the Tour de France coming through their region. A lot of these regions are regions where the French actually come on holiday too. Nice sight for the riders, though, there to see 25 kilometers left to go to the finish. And did you spot the Irish flag there? I did indeed, and he's flying proudly for Nicolas Roach here because he's having a brilliant Tour de France. Currently in 14th place overall in the Tour de France. And this is the second time he's ridden. He's the son of Stephen Roach, who won the Tour for Ireland in 1987. And that's about the nearest to uh, British shores that we've had so far. Bradley Wiggins not enjoying his Tour just now. He's a lot of ground to make up. And, of course, he was fourth last year overall. Well, Wiggins, uh, with that fourth place overall last year, was hoping this year that he could uh, seriously look at a podium spot. That podium spot is now starting to look a little bit uh, too far out of sight, I think, because Wiggins is currently 16th overall, looking for 7 minutes and 39 seconds. But if he could have a couple of big days in the Pyrenees, it's not out of the question to say that he will not get onto the podium because I still feel that the four mountain stages in the Pyrenees are going to be oh. for the riders who are the freshest. And you'll see some guys losing huge chunks of time. And the top ten overall can seriously get shaken up. It most certainly can. They are cruel, cruel, cruel. We've got three days in the Pyrenees, then we have a rest day, and then we go on Thursday next week to finish on top of the Col de Tourmalet. So they're still locked in, and I would say if they looked over their shoulders now on this big long straight of a boulevard, they would have a very good chance of seeing uh, the main field behind them. And uh, the main field at 35 seconds is probably only about 500 meters back. Just uh, a quick look at the church here, and this is the small town of Vaux. And again, uh, this is one of the very special kind of belfries that they have in the southern part of France here. The open belfries with the bells just uh, sitting at the top of the steeple. see the speed of that main field now and we're looking at a, a good average speed now and in fact uh, we're probably going to be up on schedule at the start at the end of the day this has been a very fast stage with the pressure on right from the very start um, because of the fact that I think the teams of the sprinter have decided this is one of their last chances probably for the next four or five days because the, the next big days are all going to be spent up in the big high mountain passes that's Andreas Cloden in the red jersey there of Radio Shack moving up to the front and that's Stuart O'Grady in the black and white jersey of Saxo Bank he's looking after the overall leader Andy Schleck Schleck lost uh, 10 
seconds yesterday to Alberto Contador on the climb up to Mon, but I think it was really much more of a psychological blow than anything else. Schleck, in fact, said that he felt he was almost certain to lose some time to Alberto Contador because the steepness of the climb suited the Spanish rider a lot more. And he would be he would been advised in the morning of the race by his team manager not to panic, not to try and follow the Spaniard and put himself into the red zone, but in fact just to limit his losses. And I think he did that very well. chance here just to see the speed and we are picking up quite a fast tailwind now that will be an advantage for the three-man breakaway because having uh, raced along very hard for the whole of the stage now all of a sudden they will be picking up this uh, helpful win that's mob four Luke Roberts Tony Martin Mick Roberts Mick Rogers sorry in uh, just in front of Bernard Eisel and then behind him Mark Cavendish for Cavendish will have to pull himself inside out to get over this climb but on one of the stages of the Tour de France last year in fact the fifth stage that uh, Mark Cavendish won everyone said the climb before the finish a second category climb was much too hard for the man from the Isle of Man to get over and uh, because of the work that had been done by his teammates he pulled himself inside out he got over the climb and he got himself a very emphatic victory into the small town of Obana in fact we drove through that just the night before last this is not the categorized climb this is a small uh, ripple on the horizon at 20 kilometers to go and uh, we're now uh, very much inside the department of the haute garonne and uh, having left Carmen behind the next uh, hill that the, the next climb that we will see will be the climb of saint ferriol at seven and a half kilometers to go and pretty much on the outskirts of ravel because we charge into ravel and at about 10 kilometers to go we take a right hand turn and start this very nasty little third category climb which comes at uh, seven and a half kilometers to go and it's a tricky descent for about three and a half kilometers but i do think the sprinters will get over it on this occasion but if somebody's feeling strong in the main field they may well try have have a crack at getting away from the peloton Stefani rider just on the top left hand side that's uh, Christophe Moreau he's fourth in the King of the Mountains classification he's announced uh, he announced on the rest day just a couple of days ago that this would be his last year as a professional cyclist after all he turns 40 at the end of the year he has had a very long and illustrious career now the last climb Paul will start uh about nine and a half kilometers from the finish it goes over the top seven and a half to go so we're still a little way to ride but i don't think these boys are going to make much further now spanish flag flying on the right hand side there and that tailwind of course too. is for juan antonio fletcher yeah they picked up a tailwind over the last couple of kilometers they're just about to go through the small town here of san felix lorague i think the climb actually starts phil at around about 12 kilometers to go when they first come into the outskirts of revel and they take a turn towards the right well, Rob Haldag has said that, and uh, they'd be delighted. He actually refers to Revel as a city, so they've just been upgraded from a town. And, uh, yeah, it starts there, and the boys from HTC Columbia are going to have to stay right on the front and try and guide uh, their men onto the climb. It is hardly a wide climb, not very steep, but it's so strategically well-placed today to allow someone the chance to jump away. Just before the end, it's a third-category climb, it could bring a different finish for the end. No, it certainly couldn't. I tell you what, Phil, it's a tricky descent as well uh, on the first part of that descent as it descends back into the town of Ravel. And that could give the opportunity to a lone breakaway artist or maybe a group of one to two riders trying to slip off the front. And there is the beautiful town of, uh, or the church of San Felix as well, which we've just seen the riders come into this town here. This will be the banner indicating 20 kilometers to go to the finish and uh, we've still got these three riders and it's been locked in now for around about 10 kilometers at 30 to 35 seconds it hasn't changed at all no they're just waiting to pounce on me yes they certainly are just waiting to pounce as they go through this town here it's a, a perched village just on the top of the hill of moulin in fact uh, it was first inhabited back in the 11th century when a castle was built on the top here Again, a lot of that was done by a, a very famous knight from this part of the world called Simon de Montfort. And, uh, in 1211, he actually uh, built a fortified town, which uh, was uh, put on this top, and just on the top of this hill. But since then, in uh, the 14th century, this church we're looking at here was the, is the Collegiate Church of Saint Felix, and it was ordered to be built by one of the popes from Avignon, Jean the Twelfth. 
and uh, in the 14th century it was upgraded to a, a gothic style remodeled in the 16th century and as you can see it really is a remarkable backdrop absolutely beautiful but everywhere is beautiful in this section of france i think uh, it's such a fantastic country and it's made for bicycle racing and the french are having a great tour and one likes to see that because this is their race no, it certainly is just on the top of the climb there on a clear day yeah, if you look behind you you can see the black mountains and if you look in front of you on the horizon you can see the pyrenees well that's that's uh, the way they don't want to look right now unless your name is alberto contador or andy schleck they are so hard this year as we celebrate the centenary of the mountains in the tour de france and for that reason we go over the original mountains but i suspect we'll find a better road surface on them than we did back in 1910. Yes, yeah, so when they went the first, when they made their first incursion into the Pyrenees in 1910, a lot of the climbs that the riders went over, like climbs like the Obisque, they were actually dirt roads. They were incredible, and uh, well, the riders just called the organisers assassins, but they still did it, and of course, they would, it wouldn't be the Tour de France without those beautiful mountains being part of it. But it's a pretty tough uh, incursion this year, that's for sure. 27 seconds, and they will not give up. They're making the sweat for this. They might be nurturing in the back of the mind. If only we can get to the slopes of the San Fariol, there's a chance we can win this, and they might be thinking that way. Well, they're strong riders, and we know the reputations of every man in that leading trio because Chavanel, I think, has got the best form of his career this, this yeah, three weeks. Certainly he had a very nasty accident in the early part of the season, but since then he's brought himself right to form at the right particular time. It was a serious crash. He had a, quite a bad concussion. They kept him in an induced coma for a few days, but they brought him out. And now you can see he's uh, riding with the best form ever. Funny how the world changes so fast, isn't it? It can, it's just swings and roundabouts, and that's the way it goes. That's uh, Dave Zabriskie sitting at the back. And this is uh, the Bio Valley Lorager, and this is the region where we are. And they're obviously uh, advertising the fact that they're, uh, they make uh, biodegradable foods. Excellent. Now, where are they? They're those horrible biodegradable windmills on the left. I can see those <laughs> as we're they watching the... here. The riders here going straight up the highway. That's your favorite renewable energy, isn't it? I hate them. 17 kilometers to go. Still locked in at the half minute mark. And still, as you can see, the, the huge fields in this part of France of the, uh, the Tournesol and still the big organization. I think this is uh, this is probably a ride for Mark Renshaw here today by HTC Columbia. They certainly want to, uh, I think, send a little present down to their man who was uh, ejected from the Tour de France in what I still consider a rather harsh punishment. Uh, Mark Renshaw, I don't think, looking back through his career, has ever really had any um, inflictions, infractions against him in the sport of professional cycling. And I think the judges came down on him exceptionally hard. I personally think that, uh, yes, he should have been relegated. Maybe Julian Dean should have been relegated too. And they both should have had uh, a very harsh financial fine. But that's uh, the way it goes. Funnily enough, just a couple of days before, a couple of riders have been fighting uh, fisticuffs after the finish of a stage. And one of the guys took a wheel out and smacked the other over the head. And their punishment, a fine of $300. Back to the race. Fletcher. Sylvain Chavanel and Peric Frederigo, former champion of France for B-Box Boig Telecom. He is uh, from Marmonde, which is not too far away from here. If you take the road from uh, Toulouse up towards uh, Bordeaux, you go through the small town of Marmonde. So you could say he is a regional rider. Chavanel gritting his teeth. He knows that as long as they can keep off the front end of the main field, uh, the main field could make a mistake. Although I doubt it, having got them down to this 500 meters difference between the two, they're going to get a lot of help. You can see moving up the pale blue jerseys, that's Milram. They'll be looking after the interests of Gerard Ciolik. The uh, gap now locked in at 28 seconds. Incredible the amount of work that HTC Columbia can do. You can just see at the back of that line the last rider in the HTC Columbia strip, the black and yellow and white strip. That is Mark Cavendish. He's sitting uh, locked into the wheel of Bernie Eisel. You can recognize Eisel because he's the one with the black socks on. Lamprey have got the next line just over to the left hand side. The back of that Lamprey line will be uh, Alessandro Pataki. Yeah, well, everybody is now at 15 kilometers to go. It's getting busier in front of the riders than behind them because the referees are making all the cars go round these riders. Uh, so there's a void between uh, the three breakaways and the rest. 
15 kilometers left, five kilometers in the lead. Take that off the day. They've been in the lead for 175 kilometers today. That is a long day in the saddle. I make it now, Phil, around about uh, three kilometers to the start of the climb. I would expect them to want to catch them before the start of the climb. As you can see, Thomas Vokler moving up now. This would be a good move by Vokler. He would probably be the sort of rider to look to the climb of Saint Ferriol as a launch pad to try and get himself a lone victory. Now, if he could go over the top of the climb with a 15 to 20 second advantage, he could consolidate on the descent because the descent is rather tricky. Yes, these narrow roads are only short descent, but uh, it is tricky. And the riders are being told all of the time by the race radios in their ears, by the team management, exactly what lies in front of them. They know what's coming at them. And look, Rob, Luke Roberts is doing it. Oh, and there's been a crash here. And who's got was one of the... Uh, well, I thought it was Aston. Well, it it's uh, like Jesus Hernandez. Hernandez. And I wonder yeah. if he was looking what at the happened? horse. I, th I wonder. I, I think he might have been looking at the horse on the left-hand hand side of the road. There, There's a horse galloping off. Then all of a sudden, he just decked it right in the middle of the pack. That was a nasty fall. I think you're right. He was looking to the left at the horse that seemed to be in the mode of panic. Hernandez sits on the floor. He's OK. These boys are made of rubber sometimes. They really are. Is his bike taking a real hit? Well, it has. And he's well, one of the big climbers on uh, Alberto <laughs> Contador's team. He doesn't have to worry too much about today's stage. But uh, I remember actually seeing him uh, in the crosswinds in the Tour Down Under in Australia a couple of, I think it was yeah. like last year. He was trying to sit at the back of the, uh, the echelon with uh, Lance Armstrong, and he just got blown off the road. Well, he's not going to finish with the peloton now, not at this stage of the race, and he doesn't get the same time as him at the finish either, as you would if that crash had happened in the last three kilometres of the race. That's the race rule. Uh, so he's out on his own now. He will lose time, but again, he's here to help Alberto Contador tomorrow in the Pyrenees. So, in the end of the day, he hasn't really lost too much, but he's uh, going to be pretty annoyed about that. Back with the three leaders, 21 seconds. This is amazing. But the green jersey now getting up near the front two of... Uh, of uh, Tor Hushoft, and that's significant. Yeah, he's got a teammate in front of him, keeping him at the front end of the main field. He's going to slot into the uh, slipstream there of Mark Cavendish. Behind him is a pale blue jersey. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if oh, that dear. wasn't Gerard Cholik. There's the first view in the distance. The cavalry are coming. The three boys are not going to make this hill. They've got to make this hill in about uh, two kilometres. Yep. And they're on it. They're uh, not too far away from the start of this final climb, and it's a little climb of Saint Ferriol the summit of which is seven and a half kilometers to go to the finish. George Hincapie, dead center of our picture in the Stars and Stripes of the USA, is on the same team of Cadell Evans, and he's actually leading Cadell Evans towards the front of the pack. Surely Cadell isn't going to try and attack on this climb. No, I think he's just getting to the front to keep himself in safety now. This is a split at the back end. You see there has been a little bit of a split because of the crosswinds. Absolutely. there you can see the damage and this is really all been done because of the tempo on the front end of the main field and that's why some of the big names like Alberto Contador, Cadell Evans were moving themselves to the front end of the pack. So these three now, 10 seconds is the gap looking over his shoulder you can see Juan Antonio Fletcher knows it's pretty much done. Well, Fletcher just looked over his shoulder there. He saw the pack come around that corner. He knows now that they are going to reel them in. He will want to see somebody else from Team Sky try to take over now. They'll carry hopes of Edouard Boysenhagen winning the stage in the sprint. Well, that's what he would like to try and do, and I'm sure they've been out and filmed the running towards the finish because that's what they exactly do, Team Sky. They go out and film the final five kilometres of every race when they think they've got a chance of winning, and they send it back by internet to the, the team bus so the riders can look at it in the team bus before the start of the day. There's Mark Cavendish, though, Phil, sitting in about fifth position. Fifth position on the last of his wheels. Now, here is Lance Armstrong. I presume he's in the peloton, but there is a peloton off the back here. No, he's right near the tail. Well, uh, arrière du peloton, it means he's just sitting at the back end of the race, and I think Armstrong is uh, taking it easy over these last couple of days. I still feel in the back of my mind he's got one final punch left in him, and that could well be one of the big Pyrenean stages. Well, clearly not today, because he's hanging on here, but there are riders now, about 10 or 12 riders, have lost contact with the peloton under this pressure. This is a long, thin line at the back, the action at the front now, as they're heading into the outskirts of Revelle, but I'm afraid it's not the finish. They go out up the hill of the Côte de saint Ferriol. Yeah. Ten kilometres now, so about half a kilometre from the climb. Well, there's the catch there. You can see the three leaders, and in fact, is right underneath the ten-kilometre-to-go banner. So those three riders who've dominated this race 
they're back in the fold. What the teams of the sprinters field have to do now is try and continue to keep the pace high so nobody else can launch a counter-attack. But you can be certain that a lot of riders in this group will try and see if they can get off the front of the pack now. Now, the tactics of HTC Columbia are simple. They will ride as hard as they can to stop any attacks. George Hincapi in the blue jersey there with the Stars and Stripes, he's the champion of the USA, has moved in to try and break up HTC Columbia. There's an irony in that because he was on their team last year. He was uh, one of the big lead-out men. He was the man who used to lead from 1.5 kilometers to go to 500 meters to go. But here he has a different goal in his life. He's actually looking after the position of Cadell Evans. He's moved Cadell Evans up to the front end of the pack. Evans does not want to lose any time at all over the next couple of days, and he wants to see whether or not he can get himself a position in the top 10 or possibly in the top five. This now, Phil, is the very concentrated face of Maxime Montfort. Little flick of the wrist there is to say to Mick Rogers, come through, Mick, because I can't do this anymore. No, and it's goodbye at this end now to Fletcher. His job done straight through it in one blink of the eyelid and off the back. Mick Rogers is a strong man. This is not an easy climb at this sort of speed. It is third category. It is two kilometres long, and it looks like they're just going to have to fight, and Luke Roberts still staying in there. Well, I've just noticed, Phil, that uh, Robbie McEwen has just gone off the back. On the climb now, we're at about a kilometre and a quarter to the top, and the HTC Columbia seem to me to have control at the moment. Well, it's now the turn of Milram to come on. They're going to try and keep the pace nice and high here because they don't want anybody to launch a last-minute attack, and the way to do that is put pressure on the front end of the main field and try and asphyxiate everybody to prevent that. There's the town site for Ravel. We're actually now leaving Ravel behind us. There's Stewie O'Grady. His job has been done here this afternoon. Fabian Cancellara, they're all dropping back now. That's an indication there's some serious pressure on the front end of this field. Their job is done for the day now. They're leaving it to the teams of the sprinters to carry the riders through if they can. Now is the time to watch where are the riders placing. You see Andy Schleck in yellow. He's not going to pay and lose any more seconds like he did yesterday in Mond when he lost 10 seconds. As now there is a plan for BMC today. That's why Cadell Evans has moved up. Well, this is a good move by BMC trying to get themselves, and this looks like Alessandro Balan, the former world champion. He made a move in this part of the Ooh. world last year on the stage into Obana, and they haven't responded at all, but yes, they have. Damiano Cunago is coming across with Carlos Barredo. The Petit Prince has tried now to do something, but Balan, a former world champion, this is a very typical move, and he has he's the sort of man with the strength he could hold off. He's going to need a little time over the top, and it's still about a kilometre to the summit. Well, this is Phil exactly how he won the World Championships a couple of years ago. He took off, and in that position, the man defending him was Damiano Cunigo. They were on the same Italian national squad at the time, and just behind there, you can see Cunigo. Everybody, this is a phenomenal performance here by the rider from BMC Racing. He's had a very quiet Tour de France. He's done a lot of work on the flatlands for Cadell Evans to keep him up at the front end of the standings, but this could be the surprise. This could steal the glory away from the sprinters. One kilometre to the top. Well, as he continues to pound those eastern wheels there, Balan is now riding clear here as he puts pressure on. This could be a move to spoil the party. Armstrong said, enough for me today. He's dropping away from the action now, and the sprinters are going to have to reorganise their pursuers. Well, they're going to have to stick together. They're going to have to get themselves organised if they want to pull this man back into the fold. That's Carlos Barredo just over on the left-hand side there for Team Quickstep. Now, is Cunego going to get across here? It's going to be very, very difficult indeed if he's going to keep this up now. Well, he thought he was going to. He was on the wheel of Carlos Barredo. Barredo is halfway across the gap. This is a great performance. Well-timed attack here by Alessandro Berlan. He's still got himself, Phil, I make it around about 12 seconds lead over the front end of the main field, who haven't yet panicked. The sprinters are all pretty much in the first 15 places. Well, Berlan has set such a pace here. And yet they are slowly, and that's Vinokur off again, and Luis Leon Sanchez coming across the gap as well. This well, is a great opportunism. move. Great move by Sanchez. In fact, I have a feeling the other rider with Barredo there for looked like Nicholas Roach who got himself into that gap halfway across. Well, I wonder what the plan was there because we saw Cadell Evans, but he must have come up here with George Hincapi to try and get this man into a position. And he's in a position to win this now. And if Leo Sanchez gets across, another strong, strong man in the action. 
Well, he's won races like this before, Phil. He knows how to get away on the slopes of a climb and then defend on the descent down towards the run-in. But Balan has got the power. You can just see the World Championship bands on his sleeves there. Lu Luis Leon Sanchez looks over his shoulder. It is Nicolas Roach who's got into this gap. But look at the work that's now being done on the front end of the main field. Where, Phil, where have all of the sprinters gone today? Well, this has really hit them where it hurts most. They hate the climbs, but they thought that this would not be a real climb to ruin their day. Balan isn't interested in the King of the Mountains points. I think they're the first points he's won in this year's Tour de France. But he wants to win the day, and the man who has beaten inside to the finish yesterday is Alexander Vinukarov, and he is leading across the gap now. Well, he's, he's like, caught them. He's caught Balan, but look behind her, almost the whole of the main field is starting to come up, and a lot of that work is being done by Radio Shack. I'm not quite sure why Radio Shack are doing that at the front end of the main field, but Alexander Vinokurov, he wanted that stage victory yesterday, so he's going to say, right, Kazakhstan, why don't we have this one? Well, Vinokurov was so upset yesterday when he was caught in sight of the finishing line, but now these two will be an immensely strong tandem. They really will. Uh, no, it looks as though Balan can't handle the next kick by Alexander Vinukov. Is this the day he's going to win? He's tried a lot, but they've come back. Well, it was do or die now is the turn of Thomas Vokler going Thomas off the Volker. front end of the main field. That was a kind of move we could have expected from him. Andy Schleck is comfortably there, and I wonder if they've got the power or the organization at the front end of the main field to pull Alexander Vinukov back. 6.8 kilometers to race and counting down. There's still some believe it'll come down to a sprint finish. Al Al Schleck is sitting there at the front, just watching and waiting. Torhushoft is marshalling the furs in the green jersey. He'll be very happy if those two stay away, but it's touch and go now. He's in a brilliant position to sweep up from the sprint. Well, Tor Hushoft uh, likes the climbs before the finish. He's got the power to finish this one off this afternoon. This is the tricky part of the descent. Alexander Vinokurov has three career stage victories to his credit. Here, what he's trying to do, Phil, is take advantage of the descent. You have to be a very special bike rider to stay off the front end of a finishing stage of the Tour de France, and that is what Vinokurov is trying to do. He's got himself I make it feel possibly 12 seconds advantage over the peloton but then he's got five kilometers of flat to survive to the finish this is Vokler halfway across the gap well Thomas Vokler the opportunist he wears the colors for the second time as champion of France a little bit dicey around that bend but he knows you've got to take risks now look at the face of Inakudov the man that came up the climb in Mond yesterday and in sight of the line was caught by his teammate Contador and also by Rodriguez he's going again seven seconds to Thomas Vokler that is all the gap is and 11 seconds to the front end of the main field Alessandro Balan he tried Phil he gave his all on the slopes of that climb but the fact that he got caught and passed by Vinokurov, all of a sudden the lights have gone out for him. Vinokurov, his lights are very much shining brightly here as he runs down. There's quite a descent before he runs out of descending. Then it's a matter of hanging on in there if he can. He's making the most of this descent. It's a familiar position for him. Did it down into Gap a few years ago. How did you know that was what was going through my mind? I was just thinking about exactly the stage finish when he jumped away and survived to get himself that victory into gap. Someone else now leaping off the front end of the main field. It looked like a rider from Saxo Bank. Four kilometers to go. And he's flicking from left to right now. Thomas Vokler chases him down. There's no peloton behind him at the moment. They must have a chance now. Well, this is a good close-up of Thomas Vokler, and this is the pursuit now. And Case Dupont, don't forget, trying to recover the team lead here. But Tor Hushoft is staying right in touch in green. Well, Hushoft is right up there. There's a rider in there from Lamprey. I don't think it's Alessandro Pataki, because he normally rides a fluorescent lime green bike. He may well have changed it out on the course. He may well be, not be surprised to see that Oscar Freire is in that group. There's George Hincapi going by also. Well, this is interesting. The field has decided they are not going to make a present of this stage to the sprinters. They are racing, and you're looking at the man with the red number now, Alexander Vinukurov, the man who has voted yesterday's most aggressive rider. He could have that number on again tomorrow. He certainly could. I make the time gap 10 seconds now to this man, Thomas Vokler, but 14 seconds to the front end of the main field. And in that main field, I am being told that Andy Schleck is there, Tor Hushoft and Robert Kessing. But I don't know who else could be there because it really has fraction on the final slopes of that climb. Three kilometers to go. The sprinters are steaming out of their helmets back there now. But Tor Hushoft is there and he is the leader in the green jersey. And because it's so hard, 
not a pure sprint to the line. He has a real chance. He's a strong man these days. He's a brave man, this man from Kazakhstan, Alexander Vinokurov. He so much wanted to win the race yesterday, Phil. He really wanted to get that victory. He was upset at losing by 10 seconds, but now what he's trying to do it, he's trying to come back again and hit them as hard as he can. Vokler is very rapidly going to be back in the main field, leaving only one man off the front end of this race. 12 seconds to Vokler, 15 seconds to the main field, and the green jersey of Torhushoft is right in there. Well, there is the catch by Thomas Vokler as they bring him back into the fold now. There's a reassessment here. We're looking down. Cavendish is still in the sprint here, but he doesn't seem to have too many men around him as we look at two kilometres to go. Well, everybody now is going to have to try and get themselves organised. Vokler back in the fold. It's 14 seconds to the front end of the main field while Milram are doing whatever they can to try and get the victory here. And I remember that Gerard Kjolikville, he'd said he reckoned he could get a state victory on one of the races where it was tough on the running towards the finish. But what about Cavendish still being there? He's still very much there, and he'll be sharpening his legs because it gets a little bit easier terrain-wise now. The barriers are going out a lot more than a kilometre today. This is the perfect race amongst the plantain trees of France. And Vinokurov is in the same position he was just 24 hours ago, dangling in front of the peloton of the Tour de France. Only on this occasion it panned flat to the finish. Last time it was a kilometre uphill before he could get to the finishing straight. These guys seem to have lost the pressure, and Vinokurov is actually extending his advantage. It's 18 seconds to the front end of the main field. And Milram, they seem to be losing their firepower. Well, there's a sign on the right there saying there's a radar control just up the road. Well, these boys are going to blow up the light bulbs, I think, because these guys are flying now right down the dead centre of road here. They can all see him, but if you look at the front of the peloton, Paul, I'm not sure they can catch him. Well, I'm not sure they will, but they still One have to sprint. Up. They still have to sprint, Phil. There's 35 points for the winner, but there's points for the first 25 riders on the stage. So all of those men in the group behind are still going to have to sprint, even if they don't catch Alexander Vinokurov. He is still looking at an 18-second advantage, and that face is really a picture of pain. As he now hears the cheers of the crowd, the seconds of the metres tick off. He's round the sharp bend. He's lining up for the finish shortly. He's got another flick yet. Is he going to make it? It looks like he might, you know. Well, he was disqualified in 2007 after he won stage in Albion, Ludain Viel, because he was later accused of changing his blood during the Tour de France. He served a sentence for that, but this time he can now add to his wins in Gap, Briançon and Paris, because this time they are not going to catch Alexander Vindokurov. And it's the old motto, if at first you don't succeed, you just keep on trying. And Vinokurov is coming home the winner today. And that's what he wanted so much, so dearly. He thanked the organisers for letting him back in the Tour de France when he cheated. And now he wins again. Well, that's an emphatic victory for him and for Team Astana. He will be proud of that. That will have the country of Kazakhstan rocking, I would say. But there's a big sprint now, Phil, for second place, and it's very important. There's Cavendish. Cavendish comes up on the left, checking who's making it on. Boyce and Hagen in the black. Pataki on the far right. Hushoft is washed out. Cavendish takes it from Pataki. Pataki looks to see where the green jersey finishes. They will be very close in the overall tonight. Well, I'll take my hat off to the sprinters for getting over that, but I'll take my hat off to this man from Astana and from Kazakhstan. You have to say he's come back from an awful long way to get this victory, and I'm sure one of the first people to congratulate him will be Alberto Contador. It's his seventh Tour de France, disqualified from his stage wins in 2007. He protested all along about his innocence. He seemed to confess it this year when he won Liège, Baston Liège, but he served his sentence anyway, and now he's come back to the very height of his career. There's Alberto, very, very happy. Alberto, I think, was a bit sad he had to catch him on the line yesterday, but it was a matter of time against the yellow. Well, it was an important stage for Alberto Contador yesterday, Phil. He had to think about winning the Tour de France overall. He had to think about five seconds here, ten seconds there. It was ten seconds at the end of the day, and it was the demise of Alexander Vinokurov in sight of the finishing straight. But today, he didn't get it wrong. He got there, Phil, his fourth race win of the season to go alongside the Giro del Trentino and liege Baston liege But I think that one today he will cherish for a long time. Well, the press will have a field day with him tomorrow. Uh, he seems to have won when he's drugged, and now he's proven he's won when he isn't drugged. So you have to work that one out for yourself.
Well, it's good for the team there. You can see these two boys are going to ride together from tomorrow onwards in the mountains. And now I think you will see an extremely dedicated team helper there. Well, he tried on at least three occasions to pull it off. This time it worked because of the speed they rode that last hill. Lance Armstrong just sailed off the back. He's no reason to race amongst them. If you can't win, you may as well come in, save your energy to fight another day. And tomorrow we're in the mountains and the high mountains of the Pyrenees. Yeah, it was funny just uh, listening to Johan Brunel. He said, I've never been in a Tour de France like this before. I've never had the pressure of not having to defend the race every day. And it's a lot more relaxed around the Radio Shack table at night, I think. Yep, absolutely, that's for sure. The arrivée, the Tour de France, is in here now. The ninth time we've arrived in Ravel. That's the beautiful town square. Yeah, it's a big marketplace, and uh, right in the middle there, you can see that belfry on top, and it really is quite magical. That dates back to uh, 1889. That's almost new, then. Uh, brand new compared to some of the things we've seen today, Absolutely. especially in this part of the world, which is very influenced by the, uh, the Roman invasion more than 2,000 years ago. Well, there's no doubt who won today, Alexander Vinokurov. The sprint is being led home by Cavendish and Pataki. Edvald Boysenhagen did his best to try and finish it off for Sky. He finished in fourth place today after that long breakaway by Fletcher. Rockhass was there as well in fifth place. And it's a long way back. Let's see where uh, Hushovd is in eighth place today, 13 seconds down. Uh, so it's going to be touch and go whether he keeps his lead. He might well uh, lose his lead again uh, back to Pataki. Well, it's going to be a big fight, the green jersey, all the way up into Paris. But it's also, Phil, going to be a big fight for the sprinters as well because they've got to survive for the next four stages because there's no flat from here on in. Yes, there's no way we'll be talking of Cavendish, Pataki or even Hushovd uh, tomorrow, that's for certain. No, but we will be talking about uh, Team Astana, we will be talking about Alexander Vinokurov. Uh, now have a look at this sprint here, this is Cavendish's sprint. He's there on the wheel of Tor Hushoft. he's waiting for the right moment to go. All of a sudden he feels there, Alex Alexander Pataki going on the left-hand side. He said, right, now's the time for me to go. He's up to the wheel of Tor Hushoft. he accelerates by him, and he really has got the power. And if you didn't think this man could sprint without Mark Renshaw, well, I think this is a little bit of proof for the pudding, because yes, he can, just ahead of Pataki and getting across the line there the rider from sky Edval Bosenhagen getting himself a fourth place Yaroslav Popovich coming up to the line there on the right hand side Lance Armstrong losing himself for almost five minutes at the end of the day but it doesn't really matter when you're a long way down in the overall standing so you don't have to uh, waste energy in something like the Tour de France save as much as you can this is his farewell tour and maybe he will come out and give us something to shout about during the Pyrenean mountains so no doubt about the winner, Alexander Vinokurov is the man who's won stage 13 into Ravel. Well, we're looking at a toiling peloton which is rapidly being reduced on the lower slopes here of the giant col of the day which takes us up 2,000 metres. We've only been on the col for four kilometres and an awful lot of riders have been left behind. But Team Sky are doing what they did on their entrance into the Alps. They put Bradley Wiggins right on the front here by Alberto Contador and by Andy Schleck. Let's hope they have a better ride than they did in the Alps. Well, rather a scary uh, stat, Phil, because Team Astana have just been at the front of the main field 100% of the time for the last 80 minutes of the race. And you can see by uh, the helicopter shot here the damage that they've done. Yes, an awful lot of riders have dropped off on the early slope. Sadly, just gone, David Miller went uh, because he's nursing those broken ribs. He's also got a, a heavily bandaged right arm. And so he's just unhitched, and they'll reform at the back of the race and hopefully ride in inside the time limit. They should today, because uh, although these roads are very, very steep now, it is at the end of the day only 41 kilometres to the finish. Well, uh, Tira Longo is uh, one of the riders from Astana right in the middle of the pack there. I'm just looking to see where Alberto Contador is. He's there right behind the yellow jersey. Well, briefly, you might have spotted him. Yellow jersey on the shoulders of Andy Schleck. The white jersey there on the shoulders of Robert Hessink. There's Contador, you can see him very easily there behind the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck. I'm sure there's going to be a big battle today, Phil, between those two. Well, Contador's brought the field, and I say Contador, but his team has brought the field to the slopes of the mountains today, nearly 10 minutes inside the fastest expected time for the race. And they kept that pressure on so much so, this is why the peloton imploded as soon as the climb started. So many riders fell back. Contador lost three of his teammates, they were the ones responsible 
for the high speed. Now it's up to the climbers to protect him. Anthony Charteau, and this is the, as his brute going now from the breakaway, so he's the fourth man to go. Geran Thomas was in there, but he's also been dropped, and now the attacks are coming from the peloton. Well, this uh, looks as if it's one of the riders from uh, Francaise de Joux. I'd be surprised if it was Sandy Cassar, but he is... Uh, no, it's not Sandy Cassar. He's, he's looking for something out of this, and uh, they've obviously been told to go out and try and attack these riders before they get to the summit of the climb. Also, Dave Zabriskie sitting up from that leading group of riders. So Zabriskie is gone now, leaving just a few riders left in the front. And uh, as I say, Geraint Thomas has gone as well. So there should be about four riders, three riders left here now. Van der Volle is in the blue there. Uh, uh, Amael Moya is the rider in the red. And the best placed in the breakaway, Christophe Riblon. He was looking for 24 minutes to be the race leader. There he is. He's the highest placed in the leading group. Well, this is what's happening at the back of the back. The uh, French national champion, uh, Thomas Vauclet, slipping off the back end of the group. Yes, he's not had a great tour, has he, this year? And uh, the Japanese sprinter, Arishiro, has also dropped off there now. Boy, this is going to be a lot of gaps over the mountains now because this is the high point of the day at 2,001 metres or over 6,500 feet. But they go down a very steep descent before they cross Axley Term and then climb up to the finish of another six kilometres. Now, they're setting up Carlos Sastra. Carlos Sastra won by attacking on this very climb a few years ago. He stayed away to the finish at Aix. Well, I expect that's uh, one of his, his teammates on the front doing the job to set something up. He has been sitting at the back of the pack for a long time. He won the Tour de France in 2008, and he's far enough down, Phil, in the overall standings to be given a certain amount of freedom by Andy Schleck and by Alberto Contador. He started the day, if you look right the way down, he's 15th, seven and a half minutes back. And at seven and a half minutes, they're not going to run straight at him at the moment. Uh, this is a textbook attack here by Sastre. And with the confidence that he knows the finish, he knows this climb, and very few cyclists in this race can say they know both of these climbs. Well, you know when you've won somewhere in the past, you're always a little bit more motivated than anybody else when you go back, and he won this race back in 2003 when the race finished up here. Sabello, as he continues up well, the race, uh, the stage, he won the race a couple of years ago now, the overall race for the Tour de France. But as uh, Sabello made a play the card there, we notice the shadow boxing. This is Sipsoff, who's now having a go, the climber from HTC Columbia. Everybody chipping away, knowing the infight is between Contador and Schleck. I'm not sure whether Contador will move if Schleck doesn't, so Sipsoff also free to fly at the moment. This race is going to be very interesting now. Well, Remy de Gregorio now has come out of the front end of the main field. There's a lot of action in the main field because everybody is wondering whether or not there's going to be a move by Alberto Contador. They're wearing number one. And uh, this is the Arrière du Pouleton. There's a lot of riders being put under pressure. 135 is Jérôme Pinot. He's dropping backwards, formerly the leader of the polka dot jersey, king of the mountains competition. Bradley Wiggins is riding at the front end of the main field. His uh, team Sky had him uh, paced right up to the front end of the pack. This is Yanni Brakovic. I think he's taking on board as much water as possible. This is a man who, in the early part of the season, won the Criterium de Dauphiné, a very good climber. But De Gregorio is about to get pulled back into the main field. On the front, it's still Astana, who've been doing all of the pacemaking for the last hour and a half. Well, as we continue now to the top of the, co of the uh, climb here, the Porte de Paille. 38 kilometres only remain, Paul, but they are such a vicious 38 kilometres, and still Astana continue to keep just the tempo. Some riders have slipped away, but others, the important ones, are still all together. Yeah, one or two of the lesser riders have slipped off the front, so there you can see Chris Horner riding behind the, the leader of the race, Andy Schleck. Schleck, for the moment, still looks very comfortable. I just... I, I... I think we have to find out today whether Alberto Contador has got the great form that he had last year. He was superb on the climb up to Mon, but his pedalling style doesn't always look that fluid to me. This is poor old Maxime Monfort of HTC Columbia. He's gone now, and he'll be content to just ride home today. His teammate on the back here is Konstantin Sipsov. He's joined the back wheel of Carlos Sastra, and that is a super move by Sastra. And the rider setting the pace for him is, is uh, Vladimir Gustav, who's got him away from the field. Now, just have a look here at the peloton. Little groups going off. 
There's a big infight as well for the best team in the race between Radio Shack and Case de Palm. The black jerseys are Case de Palm, the red jerseys here are Radio Shack. They're separated by, I think it's 21 seconds overall, and that time is based on three riders. Gutierrez is on the lead, is on the second place team, Case de Palm, at the moment, and he's gone. Well, so too is uh, Sandy Cassar here, the rider from Francis de Jeu. He doesn't have to worry too much. He's already got himself a stage victory under the belt, and uh, that was on stage nine. Here he's just surviving the mountains. A lot of riders know that they're in a bike race here this afternoon because Team Astana have done a formidable job, Phil, throughout the whole of the afternoon. There you can see Contador nicely uh, positioned in about 10th uh, to 15th place. Cadell Evans is also riding fairly well to the front of the main field. Yes, we're very interested to see how Cadell handles the Pyrenees now. He lost his chance, of course, with his crash, which uh, took him out of the uh, yellow jersey, really, and uh, also lost a lot of time. But can he climb back into striking distance of at least a top five finish? I think he probably can. These boys are laying a point down. I think Contador's told them to ride hard today, so there are no attacks from the strong men. This is David de la Fuente on the front for uh, Team Astana. Just over to the right-hand side, the orange uh, jersey on the shoulders of Juan Manuel Garati, himself a very good climber, the winner of the stage to the summit of Mont Ventoux last year in the Tour de France, but here working for the man behind him in the white jersey, and that's Robert Gessink. That's the most likely attack, I think, from Gessink or Menchoff on the next climb. George Hincapi being unhitched, the champion of the United States as well. It's a little bit surprised to see George go on this climb here. He's riding on his eastern wheels there as he continues to ride up the mountain. And they supply all of the BMC racing team. Well, I just noticed Mick Rogers going backwards there, Phil. This is number 118. Well, now, this is a bit of a surprise. Mick... So, well, he's here. They put the wrong caption up, I think. Because that, was, that was Mick Rogers yeah, going it was backwards. Rogers. Rogers had been dropped here. Wait a minute. No, that was Sipsov. That was Sipsov going back, so he was going up with uh, Constantine, uh, with Sastra. So as they continue, Sipsov has been ridden off the back wheel of the two boys from Cervelo. And Sastra is being guided here by his pilot fish up towards the leaders. And if he is allowed to fly today, he could be the winner of this stage. There is Mick Rogers. You preempted it, though, Paul, because he is going off the back. Well, I think they switched between the two, and it may well have been a quick shot of Mick Rogers suffering at the back of the group. And then they went up to see that his teammate was doing exactly the same thing. But Mick is not enjoying this climb at the moment. Uh, he was uh, hoping to have finish high overall in the standings. We thought that after he won the Amgen Tour of California, he would have a good crack at finishing in the top 10 and look at this Raphael Valls has caught Geraint Thomas he's really riding through this field now Geraint Thomas has got a simple plan here just to take it steady now he's lost contact with the brake the peloton's still behind him just ride steady to the top of this climb and he could still be in the leading group over the top with the men that matter but uh, this boy has really established himself as a rider in the Tour de France in front of the cameras this year he did a terrific performance in the Alps he was very close to winning a stage there and now he looks like doing the same here in the Pyrenees. Well, Nicolas Vogondi of uh, B-Box, Boig Telecom, he's going backwards now, a former French national champion, the current French time trial champion. He's obviously not enjoying his journey through the Pyrenees on day one. David De La Fuente just uh, slipping back a fraction now, waiting to see who else from Team Astana has got a bit of power there. Anthony Charteau, if he can get himself some points at the top of this uh, outside categorised climb, he will all of a sudden start to look like a solid leader in the King of the Mountains classification. There's Schleck in the yellow jersey. It's up to him to attack Contador. Contador said he didn't know what he'd do today. He's just waiting to find out, and he's got his team riding at a high tempo, which is crippling some of the riders. Lance Armstrong still in this group as well. Alberto Conte there, number one, just sitting uh, behind his teammate number nine, Alexander Vinokurov, leaving his guys uh, to do the pacemaking at the front end of the pack. Juan, Juan, Juan Manuel Garate there has got Robert Guessing behind him and uh, still sitting fairly close to the front end of the main field as well is uh, Denny Menchoff just over to the right. Well, there's four riders all split up behind the three leaders. Then you get uh, Vals, the youngster who's gone away, and he's now two minutes, eight seconds within reach of those three leading riders. And Sastra is just behind him. He's trying to carve through the lot of them. And these are the three leaders still toying the way up the mountain. Riblon, Van der Waller and Wanya, 3.23 to the yellow jersey group. So Vals has taken over a minute's lead now on that yellow jersey group. No, he's done a good job, but he's not a marked man at all. He's a long way down in the overall standings, Phil. He started the day looking for 46 minutes 
on Andy Schleck. So as they toil the way to the summit, he's just caught uh, another rider here in the breakaway. This will be Rowan Arp. Uh, just over seven kilometers still to climb to the summit of this mountain. Lance Armstrong is now losing uh, contact here with the main field, which is down to about 25 riders now. Geraint Thomas has just come back from the leading group into this pack, and he immediately looked to see where Bradley Wiggins was, and he is in the group, Wiggins. He's got at least one other teammate with him. Uh, but uh, now, off up the road, is still as it was, as, as trying to catch those three leaders out in front, and Sasta is trying to get on terms with them, and so too is Raphael Fals, but the main leaders, Schleck and Contador, are still in this group, and they haven't tried to make a move yet. Now, Brakovic has come up to Lance. Well, Brakovic and Armstrong riding side by side, and let's not forget, Team Radio Shack, Phil, needs still three men. Now, all of a sudden, this man, uh, Carlos Sass, has decided he's going to start riding on his own. There's Dave Zabriskie just a little bit further back. Hey, look but this. this looks to me as if Kirienka is coming across, but so too is the rest of the group, because the Real Jersey group is not too far behind. No, the steady tempo, this is why Sass has thought he's had to go on alone here leave his pacing teammate because they're actually going back to the field here this is an acceleration by the 2008 Tour de France winner Carlos Sastre because Kirienka was almost on and he's not quite there well this face I think reflects just exactly what this kind of race is this is Vauvernard going back he was in that early breakaway of nine riders and look at the flag at the side of the road that's an indication that this is climb is going to deaden the accelerations of these men because as they get up towards the summit of this climb Phil they will be getting a very strong wind in the face well, David Navarro doing tremendous work again in the Pyrenees as he did in the Alps for Alberto Contador is setting the pace the spread is a minute 27 what's uh, going on here Alice now now what's happened to Andy Schleck here he's got, he's got a problem I'm not sure what but, that is when you put your hand oh, up yeah. like that it's a mechanical incident you're showing yourself off to the race referees he's got a teammate there just in front of him well I'm not sure he's got a flat tyre, but that is not a way for a drink of water. That is a problem, and Saxabanga trying to get through on the referee there. And now, this is important here. Well, he wants, he wants some food, but he is not a happy man, I don't think. He hasn't got a bike problem, after all. He, he just wants to know what's going on, maybe. A word of encouragement. He's going to take that water, and he's going to pedal back in the bunch. Well, maybe it was a false alarm, but really, you don't see the yellow jersey drop back like that normally. Well, uh, for me, Phil, that is rather strange to see that happen, because if he was just looking for food or if he was looking for a drink, he would have gone there and sent a teammate back to the team car. He may well have found that he was going off the back of the Cadell. group there, and he just needed a psychological push from the team manager. Cadell Evans is at the back of the group, but uh, let's just see how Andy Schleck performs here. Well, he's got Jakob Fulslang, a teammate, riding just in front of the world champion, Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans again, maybe he's still not feeling too good, or is he too just taking a drink? Also dropping right through the field now, number 59 here, Dave Zabriskie, was in the break, and he's now seeing the riders climb past him. Well, Zabriskie was in that breakaway, he looked very comfortable uh, a little while back. Still, uh, Daniel Navarro prepared to do the pacemaking on the front, celebrating his 27th birthday here this afternoon. Also riding right up at the front, Robert Gessing. Now, as we pan down the field here, there's Sammy Sanchez with the golden helmet on, the uh, man who sits in third place overall. Alberto Contador, alongside Contador, Chris Horner looking very strong, comfortably back in the pack. There's the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck. Alongside him in the black and white jersey of Sky is Bradley Wiggins. I don't think he's in trouble, Sec. Just take a look at his face. Five kilometres to go for the boys at the front. Riblon, Van der Valle and Wanyar, the only survivors of the original nine-man break. And at 2.27 to the yellow jersey, but the groups in between are catching them. Well, it's only 1.24 back to the young rider, the 23-year-old Raphael Valls. He is eating across this gap and really doing a phenomenal job. And as if on cue, Here there he, he is. He's not too far from the catching those riders as they approach five kilometres from the summit of this very difficult climb. And you know the worst thing about this climb, Phil? Is you've got another one coming after it. That's right, the only consolation, not as steep, but the finish is right on the top of it. This is the face of Carlos Sastre. He had to get rid of his teammate. He's still pushing on alone. Doesn't want the motorbike that close to him. As he's now trying to get through here, he's thinking of catching up with Vals first. But if you look uh, 
if we could look behind, I don't know where um, Kirienka's gone now. He must have gone back. He must have gone backwards. About 30 seconds the advantage of uh, Carlos Sastra over the front end of the main field. And he's about uh, 30 seconds behind Rafael Ferris. So this will be rather interesting to see whether or not uh, our man Carlos Sastra has really got the form this afternoon. I know he will have targeted this stage. He won it in 2003. And he knows that he's not really going to be chased all that much by the big leaders because he started the day more than seven and a half minutes back in the overall standings. Still three leaders. Valis is at a minute 24. Sastra at 145. The peloton at 227. As we look here at Carlos Sastra, the situation on the mountain is still the status quo. The three riders are still up front, but this young man, Rafael Valls, is now just a minute behind the three leaders, absolutely flying up the mountain. Then you've got Carlos Sastra still being chased by Kirienka. Then you've got the main pack still with Contador and Schleck in it. These are the leaders. Well, Jürgen van der Waller, I think, has just hit the Waller because uh, he's just going off the back end of this group. He's a man from the flatlands of the north, a very good talented Belgian rider in the breakaway in the early days of the tour he's probably wondering what he's doing at the front of the race in the mountains but he's just trying to get himself through his own little piece of personal purgatory well he's just hit the slopes here which are 10 percent and he's left now with three kilometers to climb to the top a chance to recover on the descent down to Axley uh, term and then back up the finishing climb so now there's just two leaders and uh, these men on the front here is Christophe Riblon of France and uh, AG2R on the front and Wanar is the man with him. He is the best climber that Team Cofidis has brought to the Tour de France this year so he will do whatever he can to stay in contact. For van der Waller what he has to do is just try and uh, survive over the top of this climb and he may well have a chance of pulling himself uh, back on the descent. Well, Pierre Roland, this is the rider from B-Box who was in the breakaway early on and still an incredible job of work being done on the front of this pack by Daniel Navarro. This is Cadell Evans now. This is not a good sign for the world champion. The world champion now is uh, dropping off the back again. Bear in mind that he has a very nasty and painful crack in his elbow. He's... Uh, nursed himself around the Tour de France since he crashed. He took the overall lead in the Alps and then all of a sudden he just popped off the back and lost a huge chunk of time on the stage down to Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne. He is a good descender though. All he can do I think at the moment, Cadell Evans, is make sure that he limits his losses. Damiano Cunigo not looking too bad there with the pink sleeves. Spread at the moment is Vals is now 66 seconds behind the three leaders who are down to two. So he's going to shortly see the third man, Van der, Van der Wallop. There is a magnificent sight, Paul, if you're watching on television. I was sitting in the armchair, it's fantastic. <laughs> but there you can see the front of the race. You can almost see the whole of the race there. The front of the race just in one of those top little roads. Coming back down here, here is the group of all of the main contenders of the Tour de France. It's a These, big bunch still. It's still a very big bunch. We will have a major sorted, I don't think, until we get to the next climb of the day. Jürgen van der Broek looking very solid there for Belgium. Poor old Cadell Evans, he's gone off the back, he's dragging himself back into this group. He knows how important it is, he wants to stay in contact, he still dreams of getting himself inside of the top ten, and then possibly inside of the top five. Well, he looks like Chris Anker Sorensen, no, it's full sang who's coming off the back for Saxo Bank now. He's, just, he's one of the main helpers for Andy Schleck, but enough is enough. Cadell Evans is going to jump round him. When you see Cadell ride, he's still pained by that left elbow, with a small broken bone in it. Well, you know, just thinking back to what Tima Starner have done, people said, well, why didn't Saxo Bank do all of the pacemaking because they were the team of the yellow jersey? I think they were trying to conserve as many men as possible for the mountains, but Saxo Bank has a team for the flat. They don't have their big climber. And the other big climber who should have been here to help Andy Schleck was Frank, and he's at home with his collarbone broken into three places. Yeah, there's no doubt they're going to miss Frank. There's no doubt at all as they continue to climb. It's 31 kilometres to race to the finish now, but this rider... He may not be on to those two leaders by the time he tops out on this climb, but if he makes a very good descent, and it is a very, very hairy descent off this mountain, uh, there is Carlos Sastra now. You know, he won on this climb in 2003, and that was a stage win. He made his move on this very, very mountain, and when he got away then, they never saw him again. He just leapfrogged across to the next climb, and he won on his own. That was a great win for him and confirmation that he was a great Tour de France rider. But, you know, he went on after that, of course, in 2008 to win at the Tour de France. Look at the work being done by David Navarro. 
Well, I, I may well have been uh, not too kind to him before. I said he wasn't really opening up a gap on the front of the main field. Well, in fact, Phil, he's got about 45 seconds advantage on the uh, yellow jersey group. Wiggins here has got to get himself into some kind of uh, a system, but I don't like the fact that he's sitting at the back end of this group. That's never really a good indication. No, he's just onto the tail now, and until then, he seemed to be okay. Now, he's, he should be all right to get up to the summit here. He's not far from the top now. And then, uh, as I say, you've got to be very vigilant on the way down. It's a very, very dangerous descent here. This is Armel on one has just been unhitched now at the front by Christophe Riblon. Riblon is going for the King of the Mountains points, and one knows if he can just grit his teeth a little bit more. This is the steepest part of the climb, 10.5% just here, and the crowd know it because that's where they are. And this is Anthony Chateau. I take my hat off to this, Paul. He's going to claim some points on this Orcatory climb. Well, that's what he's looking for. He really realizes he's going to have a hard time defending his lead in this competition over the next few days so why not try and get yourself some points on this whole category climb the outside categorized climb it looked to me as if it was a rider coming across from Lamprey and it would be a shock to see if that was Damiano Cunigo well it may not be a surprise either that looks like Damiano Cunigo to me and he's just passed Pavel Brut there who's falling back from the breakaway Boy, the last few minutes here, it's not coming from the quarters we thought, it's coming from the riders who are trying to win other competitions. Chateau, if he gets points on this all-category climb, that will keep him in the polka dot tonight. And then it's all down for the finish. This well, is a, there's going to be a, a real big race up the last climb today. Well, the man chasing Chateau there, Phil Damiano Cunigo, he's looking for king of the mountain points as well because he started in seventh place in that competition with 56 points. There's big points at the top of this climb and there's big points at the top of the next one. But this man, he is doing a phenomenal job, Christophe Riblon of France, and he today, I think, is getting the, the accolades of the French crowd. This is, I have to say, the best Tour de France I think the French have ridden in the last, last four or five years. I couldn't agree with you more. This is Riblon's uh, third Tour de France. Last year he finished 82nd in Paris. Uh, but now he is just showing his real colours here to everyone. This is terrific riding by Riblon. As he continues now to make it. There comes the Petit Prince, uh, the little prince here, trying to get up there to get points as well, knowing that today starts the real race for the mountains competition. It'll finish next Thursday on top of the Col de Tourmalet. Well, I'll take my hat off to Damiano Cunigo. He's had so many hard, bad days in this Tour de France, and yet he always bounces back, and he's always prepared to go and have a fight at the front end of the event. So what he's looking for is a few points, and still Astana are doing the job at the front end of the main field. And in fact, you can now see that a couple of the Radio Shack riders are also starting to slip to the back of that group. In there is Chris Horner, and alongside him was Andreas Cloden. Their lead in the uh, team race may well be looking a bit precarious tonight. This rider in second place, uh, Raphael Volz, uh, well, he's nearly in second place on the climb, but Christoph Ribler has jumped away inside the last kilometre to clear up on the top of the Porte de Paille, but I don't know quite yet where this man is placed. He's third or fourth still on the climb, and it's hurting him now. He's just 23 years of age, and he's never ridden the Tour de France before. He must wonder where all these people have come from. Well, I'll give you a quick, a quick resume of what's going on. Riblon is still leading the race. He's got a gap over Moina, who's in second place. Still holding on to third place on the climb is Jürgen van der Waale. And Raphael Valtz is in fourth place at a minute and 20 seconds. Look at the face here of Navarro. He's pulling himself inside out for the team. He's pulling himself inside out for his own teammate, Alberto Contador. Moving up to the front there, Roman Kruziger from Team Liquigas and Ivan Basso. Basso also has finished well on this finishing climb, Phil. Uh, I think in 2003, he actually finished third at the top of this climb. Quick drink for Raphael Valls here. As he comes up, Sastra's almost cl uh, closed in on him here. He's going to have a useful ally if he does get on terms with him. But Sastra is having a wonderful ascent today. There is Valls, and he looked to be flying, so... Uh, Sastra has accelerated here and destroyed Kirienka, who was chasing him. This man here is trying to get some points at the top for the King of the Mountains, as he also drags his way up here. He's not that far behind Sastra and Vols. Well, in fact, he's sixth on the road, Anthony Chateau, so he will be in the points. Uh, although, uh, although Carlos Sastra doesn't look very comfortable on his bike today, Phil, he's doing an incredible job. He's riding across the gap. He now is looking for seven and a half minutes in the overall standings, but I don't think that's what concerns him here this afternoon. 
what he's thinking about is a stage victory of the day the Norwegian flags the Canadian flags are all flying here as he now comes up towards the summit of Christophe Riblan his greatest moment as a professional cyclist here as he takes out the all category climb and it's going to be his now it looks as though Sylvain Chavanel is also in a spot of bother at the back of the peloton well, he's not too concerned, Phil, there, because at least he's got two stage top. wins over his belt. And here is the top of the climb for Christophe Riblon. Now it's the daredevil descent into the uh, thermal station of Axley Term. And it is a very tricky and dangerous descent. Very, very quickly. And Bradley Wiggins here, just as we squeeze up towards the summit, has been put once more under pressure. He's going to have to call for the same courage he showed on Mont Ventoux last year when he confirmed his fourth-place finish in the Tour de France. This is nearly the summit, and he's letting them go. He's going to have to make a big descent now. Well, he is a very good descender. He can give away 30 or 40 seconds at the top of the climb, take a few risks, and get back into the group on the downhill part of the course. But it doesn't announce itself as being very... Very good for the final climb of the day up to the ski resort here of Axley Trois Domaines. Monor has also gone over the top now. So uh, Amiel Monor, two Frenchmen, first and second. They won't believe this. And the French leader in the King of the Mountains, Anthony Chateau. He won't be over next. Look at that slope. You get some idea here. This is a cruel climb. And then we've still got the finishing climb to come. Sastres at a minute 47 now. He's with Vols. Well, this is a great job by this man uh, who uh, lost the lead back to Jérôme Pinot, dragged it back again himself on a long breakaway, and now he could be laying down the foundations to win this competition. Bear in mind, the last mountain in the Tour de France this year is the Col de Tourmalet. There are no more climbs after that at all. He's got four days, four stages to try and win that competition. That is absolutely right. They've celebrated 100 years in the Pyrenees. Kirienka's almost onto the back again. But they're celebrating their 100 years in the Pyrenees to make the Col de Tourmalet next Thursday the very last counting climb in the King of the Mountains competition. Now the Petit Prince has got up to the back of Chateau and they're going to go head to head because the Petit Prince, the Damiano Cunigo, could be the winner of the King of the Mountains if he continues in this form. Raphael Vallis goes over with Sastra. Kirienka goes over. Third man over was a Van der Waller. He stayed away. And look at that, Chateau out sprints Junigo. Well, uh, I make that for uh, just about seventh place, so he's just scraping in the points there as he goes over the top. But down in the valley below, Phil, that's where we're going. So put your seatbelt on now, tie it up nice and tightly, because this is going to be a fast descent into the valley. And the pressure's on the people like Bradley Wiggins to rejoin now on the way down on this dangerous descent, because once you're down, you flick through the town of Axley Term and you're up again. Well, the main field there are just coming up to the top of the climb. Uh, not sure who it was, just jumped off the front there to see whether there were any points left. But Bradley Wiggins will have to take some serious risks on the descent. It's Christophe Moreau, 39 well, years of age. Good job, mate. He's up in the points in the competition and he's distinguished himself again here. So the order over the top, Riblom 1R, Van der Waller, Vals has gone over fourth, Sastra fifth, Kirienka sixth, Anthony Chateau seventh. He gets eight points for that. And then uh, Cunigo, he gets seven. Well, I might have done uh, Radio Shack a bit of disservice there because they've still got three riders in this leading group. There's confirmation of the way they went over the top and uh, Van der Waal is still holding on for third place. But now it's the daredevil descent and you can, almost, you can hear the wind uh, the motor, from the motorbike trying to keep up with this guy. Well, is Riblon now going to go for gold by winning the next time? He's only had one win in, in the season, that was in February, the Boucle du Sud Ardèche. Not too far from here. Now, this is how you go down a very fast descent. So you make sure you get the right line around the corner. Two Spanish now in the chase a little bit further back. This is uh, Carlos Sastra and being very sensible, serious professional bike rider knows you have to keep eating all of the time. You never can think about uh, making sure that you never forget about making sure that the energy levels are topped up because it's not for today you're eating, it's for tomorrow and the day after that. So, Astana, just to have a rider there, just getting himself uh, onto the back end of that group. It's a small group and you can see, in fact, that the yellow jersey's there. He was nice and present at the front end, so obviously being very attentive there is Andy Schleck. Carlos Sastra got to fifth place at Kirienka sixth as they went over the top of the climb. It was seventh place for Chateau, eighth for Cunigo, and ninth for Christophe Moreau.
Well, there's the result. Top 10 completed by Juan Manuel Garati. He was the rider who was first up the uh, Mont Blanc 2 last year, which brought uh, the mountains to an end in the Tour de France. And uh, it's going to now be very, very important. Chateau keeps, uh, Chateau rather keeps his lead. 115 points, Pino stays second at 92, and Morrow, those few points have kept him in third place. Well, he is very proud of his uh, third place in the King of the Mountains classification. Just as we went over the top of the climb, Phil, there was a slight split, and in that split of about eight or nine riders was the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck. So yep. Schleck is being extremely attentive. How about that for a descent? Well, it's... Uh... It is an incredible descent. There's no guardrail on the side here. These boys have got to be extremely careful. Break late round those hairpin bends. It's a race down to the valley now. Then it's an all-out assault on the last climb of the day, right up to the finishing line. Eighteen kilometres left to race. Most of this is downhill, and we still have the lone leader, Christoph Ribler. Uh, Bradley Wiggins, Paul, who was dropped on the climb, is chasing, but he's still behind the peloton with the yellow jersey. Well, he's not too far off the back of this group, Phil, because I saw him making a serious daredevil descent to make sure that he made the contact with them. So two minutes and uh, 40 seconds, that's the group between the, the lone leader, Riblon, and uh, the yellow jersey group uh, caught in no man's land at around about 20 seconds is Moinard of Kofidis, and uh, on this descent he may well make the junction once again. Then uh, the next group on the road is Sastro, Van der Waal, Kirienka Kunigo and uh, Raphael Valtz. And that's the group that we're going down with here at 20 kilometres to go for them. They're still looking for a minute and 52 seconds on the lone leader. This is Chateau, he's also caught in no man's land and he's at about two and a half minutes. He's not too far away, I don't think, from being picked up by the front end of the main field. Damiano Cunigo was with him and he dropped him on the first few corners of the descent and he actually, the Italian, rode across to the next group on the road. Chateau, I think uh, he would do better now to actually sit up and wait for the main field to catch him. Uh, with a view to maybe staying in contact with them over the next climb because if he can get himself some big points on the final climb of the day he could really be starting to look extremely solid at the top end of this race in the king of the mountains i can only think that uh, uh, the petit prince there dominant damian cunigo was uh, has just made an incredible descent and uh, Cuni uh, chateau wasn't prepared to go with him on that way down well, I don't think he wanted to take the risks. Uh, Alexander Vinokurov now is prepared to take some risks and set the tempo on the front end of the main field, the winner of yesterday's stage. Wiggins has made the junction. He's, he's the just tail. on the back. He's just come on the tail here. Uh, the peloton themselves are not taking any risks either. The men up front, if they can reach them on the climb, they may try to do so. Otherwise, I'll let them go for the day because seconds can be won and lost here from this bunch uh, with no concern for who is on the attack today. Sastra's a minute and 55 in his group now, behind the two leaders. Well, it's one leader, really, and there he is. Well, Riblon, he's got a hard task in front of him, Phil, if he wants to survive, but he showed that he's got the legs on him this afternoon by riding away from everybody on the slopes of the Port de Paez, and he's now holding a pretty big advantage over the Carlos Sastra group. He's actually extended his lead, and it's now almost up to two minutes, his lead over that group, and the yellow jersey group is actually now slowly moving in on the group of uh, Carlos Sastra. They're only 30 seconds behind Sastra's group. Well, that is interesting because uh, they seem to have lost the firepower, but here you see you've got Chateau. He must be just ahead then of the yellow jersey group. If that's the case, 16 kilometers to go. We're still out in front. Riblon free to fly, and I must say, he is doing a superb ride and a, and a candidate for the day's most aggressive rider and the red number tomorrow. There's the yellow jersey group being guided down they're guessing he's in the white jersey there he could be a candidate to try and jump away on the finishing climb today if we look at all the guys in this group now there you've got alberto contador just ahead of andy schleck behind him it's roman Kruziger still moving up the chris anker sorensen is the man who's going to do a lot of work today he's going to have to really do something special to stay with andy schleck for as long as possible Well, the beauty of the area now being totally ignored by the riders that they cross the way through here. This is uh, water over the head, water down the tummy for Damiano Cunigo. There's Chateau, and I think the peloton might be there. They are. So they're picking up Anthony Chateau here now, who has fallen back to them. And the next challenge will be to catch the group Sastra. Well, that gap is not very big at all, Phil. It's about 40 seconds to the Sastra group, and they're not really too concerned about catching him. I think they're more concerned about setting themselves up for the final climb of the day. 
I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be one terrific ride up to the finish today once we're across the town of Axley Therm. This is Riblon, the leader who has ridden superbly today, and he might yet do it, you know. Two minutes 40 to the peloton. It just depends how vicious the infighting gets on those slopes. There's the Mayo Jean riding right on the back wheel of Alberto Contador. Keep an eye on him, that's his job today. I'll tell you what, Phil, it's going to be a, a tough job and a tough call for Reblon because when you look at the big boys who are in that group behind, all of the top men are there. I just noted Joachim Rodriguez was in there as well. He'd be a candidate for trying to get himself a second victory. But in the back of my mind, I do still believe that Alberto Contador wants to try and get the win today. Kunigo looking over his shoulder, trying to figure out uh, what sort of time gap they've got. Well, I can tell him he's got 40 seconds over the group with Andy Schleck and Chateau and Gessink, and those are mainly most of the big contenders, but we will have some serious attacks, I think, once we start this next climb. Vinokurov is doing a lot of pacemaking in this group here, and as you can see, the numbers are starting to swell, and what's happening there is a lot of the riders who were dropped over towards the top of the climb took serious risks on the descent and managed to get themselves back into this group which is swelling in numbers and that might slow it down a fraction before the start of the final climb right just the final climb to come on stage 14 and we've just taken our final break of the race we're with it now all the way up to actually 12 men Christoph Riblon out front the race for the yellow jersey about to start behind him 10 kilometers to go for the immediate chase and one yard who was with uh, Riblon at the top of the climb and then was dropped has just rejoined it's a magnificent crowd here we descend into Axley Therm and now these boys are going to be on the slopes very shortly and I noticed on the climb too the flag of St George flying well Wiggins is going to start the climb alongside the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck Sitting on the back of this group is number 91, and that is Carlos Sastra. What he has to do now is try and ride across a two-minute gap if he wants to rejoin the leader. But France this year are doing something very special in the Tour de France. Moinarfil almost got himself back to the wheel of Christophe yeah. Rablin, but not now because he's all of a sudden disappeared. The trouble is he, he didn't quite get on before the climb started. There he is. The impetus has gone out of those legs now. This is a tough start to the climbs, especially gets a little bit easier in parts as we swing away from the town but basically now it's all uphill to the finish and Riblon a professional only a few years he turned pro in 2005 he's only ever won four races in his life and yet just before he turned pro he showed us what a good rider he was because he finished second in the Tour de l'Avenir the race of the future what they call the amateur version of the Tour de France so he is a good rider he is a great rider and now we're going to start the climb here with this team Astana on the front end of the main field. I'm amazed at the job of work that's being done there, Phil, by Christophe Moreau, the 39-year-old on Case Stepania. He's trying to set something up for Luis Leon Sanchez as the next group on the ride starts the climb, looking for 2 minutes and 23 seconds on the lone leader. Well, this is a very elite little chase group now, and Vales has had his wings clipped for the moment, number 219, but I wouldn't trust him because I think he might go again here. They're going to let the old elder statesman, Carlos Sastra, lead them on the climb. Sastra won on it back in 2003. Well, Sastra has got a long job ahead of him there. Seven and a half kilometres. Alexander Vinokurov in second position there behind Daniel Navarro, who's done an incredible job of work for Astana this afternoon. And in fact, they're opening a little bit of a gap on the team leader there because there's Alberto Contador covered by uh -oh. the yellow jersey of Andy Schleck, followed by Joachim Rodriguez. It's the familiar dancing style of Alberto as he comes back up. As soon as that gap opened, he locked into it straight away. Luis Leon Santos is also here at the front. These two boys are going to go to their limit now for as long as they can and move away, and then the fight will start. The big battle will start now. You can see uh, Kirienka, he's now been put under pressure. He is a great rider, second on the stage, down into gap, but on a race like this, you've just got to find your rhythm. You can't match the accelerations of a serious climber like Carlos Sastra. And Sastra's on his day today, inspired by this climb, which he won in 03. Uh, Cunago has had some good days in the Tour de France, but they've always been in the mountains, and there he is now, right alongside Carlos. And Rafael Valls, well, he knows now he's in a real fight in third wheel there. This is the start of the day, though, just now. Christophe Riblin. 
Ribla, he opened up to around about three minutes. He's still looking at 2.55 over the yellow jersey group, and Carlos oh. Sastra's gone again. He's got to go on his own now, Carlos. If he's going to catch Ribla, he's got to go alone. But look at the reaction from Cunego. Cunego, Phil said he was dying to get a stage victory at the Tour de France. Chateau, well, he's got some points out of today's stage, and now all he's got to do is try and survive. Up and down this group, the team of Astana are trying to control. Look at the face of Luis Leon Sanchez sitting in second place. Contador is in third place, dancing on the pedals, but right on his wheel is the yellow jersey. And look at Astana. So we're looking here now at uh, Sastra now. Riblon is heading up the charge here. He's still on his own. Look over his shoulder. You get some idea how steep the climb is. It'll zigzag and herp in its way to the summit. This guy has got to start dreaming of the greatest day of his cycling career. Well, he's still holding on to a huge chunk, and Astana, Phil, are really rallying around their man this afternoon. Daniel Navarro was slipping away from the group just a few moments ago, and he thought, no, Contador needs me just a little bit more, so he's moved back to the front end of the group here with Alexander Vinokurov. Well, Vinokurov is magnificent. From winner yesterday to perfect teammate today, and he's now he's getting a little bit tired, but he's driving on at the front. Wiggins is hanging on at the back, and he's got to hang on. This is a slightly easier climb, or different climb, than the one where he was dropped. He may hang on in here. Bradley, though, is in the dangerous end of the race. Well, this is uh, now Alexander Vinokurov's turn to put it to his team, because after all, it is the team that he brought into the sport when he went to the government of Kazakhstan and said, guys, we need to put a professional team together, and they came together and created Astana. All the five top riders in the race are locked in this peloton together, and Levi Leipheimer is in here as well, so top six certainly are here. As uh, I can tell you, the Belgians will be screaming back home there too because Jürgen van der Broek is locked in. And look at this now. Is he coming back or is he being dropped? I'm not sure he's going to make it. Cunego is in trouble. Sastra has sprouted wings today. Well, he's now uh, starting to eat into the advantage of Riblon and Wana. He's looking for two and a quarter minutes. And he's the kind of man who can ride across two minutes on the slopes of a climb like this. Vinokurov is doing an incredible job here for his team while at the back... There you can see the uh, the leader of Team of Francaise de Gere is in difficulty. The best man in, of France last year, Christophe de Mervel, alongside Bradley Wiggins. There's been so many good Frenchmen this year, though. One has to say that as they continue to climb up the mountain here. This is uh, Kreuziger. He sat at the back now and looks as though he has been cooked as well. We didn't expect to see him unhitched. Now, where is Wiggins gone? I think he's also gone off. Well, Beredo going backwards too. You can see now Vinokurov is decimating this field. Levi Leipheimer just getting onto the back end of this group. Sammy Sanchez is there as well. Well, Vinokurov has been superb for the last three days of racing, and he's showing it again today as riders continue to unhitch. This is Sipsov also going back. The boys on the Uskatel Uskadi team, Igor Martinez here. A little bit surprised to see him get dropped. The climbers are being destroyed now. Well, just getting on the back there, the young climber from Omega Pharma Lotto, Matty Lloyd. Well, he's also struggling here. 2.11, Sastra to the leader. It might be too much today to spoil the party for the French as we head towards the first of the opening day of four in the Pyrenees. And number 81 there is Nicholas Roach, also having another good day with the men that matter. Ivan Basso won the Tour of Italy. It's a different ball game in the Tour de France, Ivan. Well, this is a big crack here. We're looking here now at uh, Andreas Cloden. This is a group a little bit further back. There's John Gadre, number 85, a great climber for AG2R. He's got to try and defend the position of Nicholas Roach here this afternoon. Well, everybody is giving just about everything they have left on today's stage in the Tour de France. They may be riding together, but they're not. They're just hoping their strength will last out as the summit approaches. Five kilometres to go, and Vinokurov has just shot away from the front of the bunch. It's almost as if Contador might have said, why not go and see what you can do? Because Contador doesn't seem... And watch out, he's dancing through the pack. Well, I'm not this really is guessing, sure. Paul. Guessing is dropped. That's probably why he's done it. He's trying to destroy the opposition this afternoon and maybe set himself up as a launch pad for Alberto Contador. Guessing second in the best young rider competition starts the day in seventh place overall. Vals has gone. He is really struggling. Uh, can see Levi Leipheimer is still there. He's sitting currently in fourth position. There's a little bit of a, a dancing match going on, though, Phil, wow. between uh, number one, Alberto Contador, and Andy Schleck. But Jürgen Vandenbroek has come right up behind 
behind number nine there. The Belgian rider could move up overall tonight. Schleck doesn't want to go anywhere. He is just watching the man who's 31 seconds behind him in the Tour de France, and he's not going to bother to attack by the look of it. And everybody else is destroying themselves. They need time for that race for third place in Paris, and they are prepared to go for it. Well, look at this. Jürgen van der Broek hanging on to Vindekurov. Van den Broek looks splendid. Behind him, it's uh, Joachim Rodriguez, but the man who is third overall at the moment, Phil, is in this group because Sammy Sanchez is there in sixth position in the orange jersey, just behind the other orange jersey on the Rabobank rider, Denny Menshoff. There he is, 181. Uh, Leipheimer is ahead. It looks like he might be the only uh, Radio Shack rider left now. I don't think Andy Schleck is in any trouble at all here. A bit of puffing and blowing there from Alberto, but somehow I don't think he's in trouble either. Good to see Luis Leon Sanchez in this group as well, in the black and red jersey of Case Stefania. Alexander Vinokurov has got the legs this afternoon. He's really doing a storming ride. The leader, Phil, still holds on to around about two minutes over Carlos Sastra. It, this is the ride of his life. It says five and a half kilometres to climb. Remember, the climb will end at around three leaving him a little over three, nearly four, and then he's free to go over the top, down the hill, and straighten out his jersey for the win. It will be an incredible result, and the newspapers will dance with him tomorrow, I'm sure of that. Here comes Sastra. Uh, the, the time check, let me have a look. The time check is 2.04 for Sastra. Well, he's not eating into the advantage of the French leader, Riblon, as fast as he needs to if he wants to win the no. stage. He, in fact, is slowly being pulled back by the group of Schleck because, Phil, they're only 24 seconds behind him, and that's all because of the work of Alexander Vinokurov. But there's only nine riders left. It was like the breakaway start of the day. There's nine riders left in the peloton now. That's it. And these boys are racing for third place, so seven of them will think of third in Paris now. The others are really racing for first and second, the yellow and Contador. Vinokurov again, this man has really been a big influence in this Tour de France, especially this past three days. Look at the way he's looking over his shoulder there, he's trying to do it, he's riding away again, he's stronger than everybody else in this group. Well, Van den Broek, I tell you, this guy's become an absolute superstar in Belgium his last two weeks as they continue to go on to the climb now. As the clean bottle is up alongside the riders now, and I must say, that's a remarkable invention, but they're going to invent something special now to catch Riblon here. Well, Riblon has really got to keep himself uh, just inside of the red zone. He's got to ride right on the edge of the pain barrier. He's got to try and push that pain barrier just a little bit further forward as he still holds on to a two-minute advantage. Two minutes 28 to the yellow jersey. Sastra may well be coming back, and he didn't want that. And now it looks as though Levi Leipheimer's in trouble. Leipheimer has got to dig deep now. He's not far to the top of this climb. This is an important moment for Leipheimer now if he wants to be on course for third place in Paris. Well, sixth overall at the start of the day. He may well lose that, lose that to uh, the men in the group because Rod Rodriguez and Sanchez behind him in the overall standings are currently sitting in that group there. Eight riders, Kirienka's coming back to make them nine once more. So too is the little prince there, Damiano Cunigo, because there they are. So a chasing group of eight. Levi has got back on with an incredible sprint, and Guessing is doing the same. These are professional bike riders on their absolute limit, but they're professional bike riders, and pain is part of the game. Well, one man who's given all of his pain is Alexander Vinokurov because he's slipping off the front end of the pack. Now we are getting to the stage where we might start to see some accelerations coming from the big leaders. Kirienka is there. He was in that leading group a few moments ago with Carlos Sastra. Now all he can do is hope to survive. Well, the body comes, it recovers, you go again, you hurt it, it goes back, you go again. That's the yo-yo effect it's having today. Jürgen van der Broek is leading the pace at the moment. Vinokurov from the front to the back in one easy motion now, as he may well unhitch here. He's four and a half kilometres to the finish. He's still got uh, three kilometres to climb. Well, you do maybe, Phil, have to question the violence of the turns he was doing on the front because now he's put himself into difficulty mm -hmm. and all of a sudden Alberto Contador doesn't have any teammates in this group to help him. There's Alberto Contador, and he's made the move right in that steep part of the corner there, and immediately Andy Schleck is right into his slipstream. Schleck was waiting for that. He's been waiting for that through all of the afternoon. This is a big move here, and trying to come across the gap also now is Denny Menshoff. 
Tried it under the five kilometre to go banner. He's looked over. They've pulled back Sastra as easy as that. And now the man that started and set it up is also getting back into the chase. Well, that is uh, Vinokurov, and that was a very violent attack there by, Alec, by Alberto Contador. I tell you what, Andy Schleck was ready and waiting for that, and he was straight onto it, not like he was on the climb up to Mond. But well, watch out for Menchop, because he's looking over his shoulder to look where Sanchez is. There he is. He's just got across. There's only 13 seconds between them. If Menchop gets away, he will be third tonight. Well, this is the damage that's done a little bit further back. You've got Luis Leon Sanchez, Levi Leipheimer and Alexander Vinokurov. His job done for the day. So, there's another move there. And I can't see, but I think it must be Menchov who's decided he's going to put the hammer down. And there, no, it wasn't. In fact, it was Sammy Sanchez trying to get it. It is going to be so difficult. Four kilometres to go. And now is Contador and Schleck going to call it a draw on the first day in the Pyrenees? There are three more days to come. Three more very difficult days to come. And in that group, all of the big boys we've talked about. Carlos Sastrafil, he wants to have another go. He knows that these guys are going to watch themselves very carefully. And he knows he's got a chance of getting himself the stage victory. And they've given him some freedom as they slow down. The but let's tactics. see. The tactics of a great bike race unfolding on a mountain. And Sastra gambling, they won't go for him. And they've never been going for him. They've been fighting amongst themselves. So he's going to try again. It's Jürgen Vandenbroek there now. Denny Menchoff is in this group. We've seen the puffing and blowing of the man who's won the Tour de France twice. Even to the great climbers, it hurts. And look at the face of Vandenbroek. There is Menchoff, the silent assassin. He's right at the front now. Well, you know that none of the faces of these guys are showing any sign of weakness at all. We're going to have some great battles still in this Tour de France. They're two minutes and six seconds is still the lead of Riblon. He should be looking, Phil, at a stage victory for France. And who would have picked his name out of the bag this morning? Well, our cameras are staying with the battle halfway down. But let's uh, not forget to give that man up the road all of the credit he deserves today. Well, the fire of the moment has passed and Levi Leipheimer has ridden himself almost back in. A big effort. He's with two riders there from Case to Pond, including Sanchez. It's now Joachim Rodriguez on the front. Katusha, the winner, up to Mond. He's looking over his shoulder and he's trying to shake a few riders out of this pack. And all of a sudden he gets relayed there by Denny Menchov. This is probably the best Denny Menchov has been at the Tour de France, Phil, for the last couple of seasons. Well, Cunigo made his effort to get away. It didn't work out because of the way the riders raced each other. They've now caught him, and it looks like they might even drop him before the finish here. The guessing has been back to the peloton. He's now hanging at the back here. Sanchez, 1-8 once. It's third overall in the Tour de France. He can't afford to get dropped by more than 13 seconds. Well, I can't see a weak man in this group now. I think we're seriously looking at the top men of the Tour de France this year. There are the four kilometer to go as well. And the banner there is two minutes and four seconds that they reach it after the leader, Christophe Reblon. Well, as the leaders go through, they are six tenths of a kilometer behind the man out front. Surely that is enough as they pick up and one are now, who nearly made it to the front. Now he's back in the chase. As that would mean there's only one man left in this race, and that is the man who leads it for France, and Christophe Riblon. But this is where the big battle royale is. There's a move oh, by Contador. You could see them both grit their teeth at the same time. And again, he was ready for it, Paul Schleck. Well, Schleck was right on the wheel, and Alberto Contador, Phil, cannot open the gap on Andy Schleck. And I keep wondering, I wonder what it would have been like if Frank had been here. There's another one. Well, this man is ready, though. He's just content to watch Contador. You've got to take your hat off to them both. They are racing each other for the final victory in the Tour. Those vicious accelerations have dispatched Sastra into the chase group. Well, going back there, you can see uh, there's Moana. This is Gessink. This is, in fact, Jürgen Vandenbroek and Rodriguez also now being put into difficulty by those violent accelerations. And I'm just remembering what Johan Brunil always said about Alberto Contador. Well, I think Sanchez has gone there. The camera's just caught him. Sanchez has just gone. But Menchoff is going to bring back the top two riders now. Well, Sammy Sanchez is trying to get rid of the man just behind him. That is Denny Menchoff. They are third and fourth. The first four riders in the race, there they are. Well, Contador must now be asking himself questions, but I was just about to say what Johan Brunel said. Nobody can attack as many times as Alberto Contador on a climb.
It's a long time since we've seen a battle like this on a mountain between there. The top four riders this morning in the overall classification, they are riding the mountain towards the finish together. Phil, look at this. I've never seen this. I've never seen this. They are actually doing a track stand on the slopes of this climb. Alberto Contador and Andy Schleck. Schleck says, mate, you want to beat me in the Tour de France? I'm going to ride behind you all the way to the top of this climb. They are shadow boxing. It's an in-fight. They are both pretty equal in ability right now. This is why Andy Schleck thinks his advantage of half a minute could be enough to win the Tour, and I would not agree with that. He's got to get more time. Guessing is going into the pain barrier again. Every time they slow down, he comes back in the race, and now he's gone to the front to do the work. Well, I've never seen anything like that before, but, you know, this must be a little blow, I think, to the confidence of Alberto Contador. In the past, he's run away with these kind of climbs. He's jumped, and nobody's been able to follow him. He's done it a couple of times here, and he's not been able to outfox the man in the yellow jersey. I have to say, number 11, Andy Schleck's confidence has gone up 100% in the last kilometre. But look at this, the Spanish are the supporters here, they're shouting at Alberto. At 2.3 kilometres, there's not going to be much of a change today now. A minute 50, this is the leader and receiving the Spanish applause as well. And there's the American flag flying, there's the Irish flag on the right. They're all here to see the Tour de France. They might have even thought this was Nicholas Roach, but it's not. It's his teammate, Christophe Riblon. Now, these two are going to go back and start fighting. They have well, not been this dropped. This is amazing. Phil. They have not been dropped from the group. They are just watching each other. This is a psychological battle that they're playing. It's a dangerous psychological battle. And I wonder what Alberto Contador is going to do. They are marking each other out of the Tour de France. Well, they've got a bit of time to do that, but Contador has had enough by the look of it, and uh, Andy Schleck is playing poker. He is just gambling. These boys are closing the gap on the top two riders in the Tour, and all of a sudden, Robert, uh, Robert Gessing is now feeling good again. Well, Gessing now sees the chance to move himself and, of course, his own teammate, Denny Menchov, a little bit further up, and this is really amazing what is happening here, and I tell you what, somebody's got to move. <laughs> Denny Menchov now has come over the top and he said, right, these guys want to play uh, games as juniors. I'm going to come to the front and start to put a little bit of the hammer down this afternoon. Well, now it's all on a game, Paul, because Menchov is now trying to take third overall tonight. He needs just 13 seconds to do it. Well, I tell you what, I'm not quite sure what sort of a game these two boys are playing here, but it's a very dangerous game that they've decided to take on because allowing somebody like Denny Menchov, we had said over the last couple of days, Phil, the silent killer, well, he really looks like he's going in for it at the moment. Well, watch out. Denny Menchov is being chased by Sammy Sanchez. Through the crowd comes Samuel Sanchez, the Olympic champion. He's seeing his biggest dream uh, fading here because he's off the wheel of Menchov. 14 seconds difference at the line. We have a new man in third place tonight. What an incredible Tour de France this is really turning out to be. Now, Andy Schleck has finally been persuaded to set the pace. Two kilometres to go for Menchov. Just behind him, about seven, eight, nine seconds, is Sanchez. 14 seconds and he's up to third overall and Sanchez has lost it. Well, the other thing that it will do, Phil, it will actually, instead of uh, separating the time gaps as we thought it might do on this stage, it's actually bringing them closer together because we'll see Menchov and Sammy Sanchez getting closer to Schleck and Contador. Let's not forget that, that Riblon is almost home and our cameras are certain to show us that because he is French. But this is an incredible battle and I do think that Sanchez might be clawing his way back. Well, he's not panicking at all, Sanchez. He's been motivated by the fact there's a huge number of Basque supporters up here. He's actually one of the few riders on the team who is not Basque, but he is the Olympic champion. There are the Catalan flags at the side of the road there. The Spanish flags are there as well, and they're probably wondering, listening oh. to their radios, what's Alberto doing? Will this finish ever come for this man who broke away and led over the top of the previous climb, the Paia? He's now almost at the summit of the climb before he gets a little bit of downhill and a chance to soak in the glory at the top of Axe Trois de Main. Well, this man, uh, he doesn't really know what sort of drama is going on behind him. And you know what? In the back of his mind, Phil, he doesn't really care either because no. he is ploughing his lonely furrow at the front end of the main field. He's itching to see that banner over the road, which shows him he's going under the King of the Mountains point because after that, it's a one and a half kilometres to the finish line and it is oh so much easier.
And let us not forget, this man will have been in the lead for the best part of 160 kilometers. A little check over because he's over the top of the climb. He'll swing right here, slip the gears up. He's on his way down. He kicks up to the line. I think he's going to do it. Well, he's got to the flatter part. He'll actually go slightly downhill here. He's got a um, kilometre to go. He's got a minute advantage over Menshov. Menshov is not going to build a minute, couch back a minute in this final kilometre because this is reasonably flat. He's just making sure now as he flicks his gear levers, which are on the handlebars, on the brake levers there. Menchov here is being slowly but surely brought back to the fold by his arch rival, Samuel Sanchez, the Olympic champion. That's not a 13-second gap anymore. Well, Sanchez is a champion, Phil. He won the uh, Olympic championships in uh, Beijing in style. And here he's pulling himself back into this race slowly but surely. Menchov is panicking. Menchov is trying to see what he can do to get the advantage. Maybe not over Sanchez, but he's trying to claw his way back to Schleck and Contador. And still, the Frenchman at the front, he's really making a meal of this one. For France, it is a phenomenal win in the Pyrenees. Boy, they can't do a thing wrong at the moment. The French, as they continue on now, with Christophe Ribla on the French AG2R Mondial team. It's a team that we've seen race around the world. They support all of the world's great races, and now they are winning the stage in the world's greatest race, the Tour de France. And this is Ribla, who's led just in the manner of Sastre in 2003. This is going to go down the finest victory in his career. He is 29 years of age, and France are flying it high on this opening day as we celebrate 100 years of the Pyrenees in the Tour. It's fitting. A Frenchman brings us home. Christophe Riblon takes the line. What a terrific ride he's done today. And he'll still be nowhere in the overall tonight. And do you think he cares? Not a bit, but Sammy Sanchez does. Look at that, he's caught up with Denny Menshov, and these guys will be riding for second and third place, and they will be extending their... Well, they will be narrowing their lead between themselves and Andy Schleck and Alberto Contador. But that was a great move for France, I have to say, this afternoon. This is the next group on the road. This is Jürgen Vandenbroek with Schleck and Alberto Contador. Well, they've been fought to such an extent, they've allowed the riders to go away, they've got themselves organised a bit, but they're giving just a bit of time today to Dennis Menchop and Samuel Sanchez. Locked together, overall split by 13 seconds, they will still retain third and fourth tonight, just as they did at the start of the day. The silent assassin, though, is holding some great form, and Sanchez knows it now. So... Menchov takes third, and fourth will be Sanchez. Well, that's a great ride by them. Here's the sprint now for Andy Schleck. He's going to have a little shot. bit of pride here, and he's going to try and take himself fourth place ahead of Joachim Rodriguez, and he's bringing them up to the line. But what a staged victory there for the French. And there we've got the Andy Schleck, who's done a great performance. Contador is going to ask himself some strange questions tonight about how can he win this Tour de France. It's just a reminder, I did say third for Menchov, he was of course second and third was Sanchez and fourth was Schleck. He got his own back at the end of the day, it was a great day for Andy Schleck. No time gains of course, uh, but he finished in front of Contador. Leipheimer did not get back in the infighting there as our cameras diverted, so we can't show it, that will cut away to the finish. There we are. Here comes uh, Cunigo as well. Followed by Sastra, who played all of his cars today. He really believed he could win. He didn't count on a man like Riblon. No, that was a great performance by Riblon this afternoon to survive on the slopes of this climb. But for what kind of battles are we going to have over the next three mountain stages? Coming in there, rider Hazardal, just ahead of Vinokurov and Luis Leon Sanchez. What a magnificent crowd up here as well. But, you know, the way to watch the Tour de France is to see it on television. We witnessed today an incredible battle. And at the end of the day, it would have been very sad if this man had been caught near the finish. It was an outstanding performance. As I say, he's only won four, won four races in his life. The fifth one means a lot. Chris Horner coming home there. And that's Nicholas Roach saluting the sky, saying, hey, my teammate won, well done. There's Cloden coming in as well, Wiggins in that group, and uh, Ivan Basso as well, but they're starting to lose at some big chunks of time. Well, again, the classification will open amongst many riders. The battle for the third place, well, very slightly clearer tonight. Paul Sanchez is still hanging on in there, though. Overall, it's Menchov in second today, Sanchez is third, Schleck is fourth, Jacqueline Rodriguez still climbing well as the riders continue to come in here. 
and uh, there's a lot of riders finishing already three minutes has gone by Carlos Astor by the way finished in 10th place today Contador would have finished in seventh at the same time and that's what counts as Andy Schleck well uh, the big question is uh, what exactly were Andy Schleck and Alberto Contador doing that's going to be a massive psychological battle between those riders for over the next few days still at the same time difference between them at the start of the day 31 seconds and Sammy Sanchez with that great comeback there holds on to third place overall well they've uh, reduced the gap there as uh, this is uh, congratulations to Riblon there from Andy Schleck. Uh, Schleck uh, defended today, and I think psychologically he put a little bit of pressure onto Alberto Contador, who in the past would have walked away with a stage like that. And maybe he's not as great as we think he is. He's got to come out tomorrow and do battle once again, and it's going to be rather interesting to see if he can. And uh, great ride there, really, by this man, Christophe Riblon. That is quite phenomenal for France. And I'm going to see if I can just listen to his interview. Alors vous savez, Christophe, ce qu'ont envie de faire les millions de gens qui nous regardent, ce que je vais faire maintenant. Bravo, tout simplement. Vous avez été uh, giving him his congratulations. Merci. C'est. J'ai eu des sensations mitigées depuis le départ du tour. I had uh, a very, really strange feeling since the start of the tour. I wasn't very happy with what I'd done so far. And then, then last night. Um, I, I thought to myself, you know, you've got to do something, you've got to get into a breakaway, you've, you've got to try. And uh, my legs were really good today, better than they've been. I just, I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm quite emotional, it's incredible. In the, the group of nine riders, everybody worked well together. The, uh, the, the, the time gap went up to, to ten minutes. Did you start to believe that you could survive and uh, win? Yeah, the, 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 the gap went up uh, very quick, and then we knew that Astana were chasing behind. And I knew that Contador really wanted to win here, and I just had to do what I could. And we wanted to get to the bottom of the final call with as much advantage as possible, without using too much force. Then I did a, I did a really good climb, and I, I resisted quite well. I'm, I'm very happy. So for, uh, that makes uh, a long time that I've been waiting to try and uh, get a victory like that. Last year I wasn't too far off, a couple of times, uh, yeah, but it's exceptional what's happened to me. And on top of that it's even better because it's a Sunday, because a lot of people are watching on TV. So uh, greetings to all of the family who are watching. And uh, thanking his wife. Well, it was a great performance, I've got to say, Phil, and uh, I, I wondered at the start of the climb if he did have enough time advantage, but he obviously knew his legs a lot better than us. He also is an extremely good track rider. He finished uh, in uh, second place in the Madison at the World Championships on the track a couple of seasons ago, so he knows exactly how to turn his legs quickly. He's a tough operator in his third Tour de France. He's always finished. Let's have a look at the overall situation now. Andy Schleck, still the same, 31 seconds Sanchez still uh, in third, that same 13 seconds separating from Menchev. Uh, Vandenbroek is fifth, and Guessing completes the top six.